straight from the top, ready or not. I got my bro straight from the top, ready or not. Ready? No, I got all my band on, no. I'm just making all this money, yeah, I'm catching no. All my niggas in the street trying to get it all. All my niggas by the guap, yeah, we get it all. The last time I checked, there was a little, little, little support here with me. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? Um, welcome to the Global Sunday Show. Uh, this is your boy Lungani. Of course, you know the name by now. Um, yeah, as you saw, um, we description here to return, and we mentioned that um, um, Spongilam Goma is currently traveling. But um, I have my uh, beautiful panelist who's going to uh, make an announcement. I'm just going to welcome you all and thank you so much um, for staying with us. And we are really sorry. I apologize um for delaying uh you know so <clears throat> uh we're trying we're trying we're trying we're trying um to to climb on top of the roof so we can find signal and also spongilam goma is on top of the plane trying to find signal as well so she can communicate with us <laughs> it's just a joke um but yeah let me uh introduce um my uh, lovely beautiful um panelist <clears throat> are you ready for this one all the way from Australia, we've got Claire, Miss Claire. I don't know if that's proper. Hi. But, uh, <laughs> all the way uh, from Germany, people tuffle, Mr. Charman. <laughs> <laughs> all the way from Arizona, USA, Mr. Laden. I call him Kitty uh. Kitty. <laughs> all the way from Australia again, Mr. Pike. I feel like playing Hello. flute. Boo, 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 boo. <laughs> Welcome to Hello. the Global Sunday Show, my lovely, beautiful team. Welcome, everybody. Pipo, why don't you start? I wish everybody a good day or evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, currently, we have four or five different time zones here i'm also traveling today but i'm very happy that i managed to set up temporarily in greece so we say kalispera which means good evening or yasas everybody which means hello and i thought maybe i want to ask the question how the arts have been affected in the last year and a half and what's been happening in your areas guys claire you're first yes i am and i was just it was it's just such a void actually really it's um so i'm in melbourne australia um everything keeps on getting put off or, you know, I went to, so we're in lockdown at the moment. Um, once again, I think this is our six locks lockdown. Um, I went to a perform a theater performance about six weeks ago. Where are we? We're in August or at the end of August. No, at the beginning of August, went and saw a show that I was really looking forward to going to see. It was King Lear. And um, Evelyn Crape, who is an amazing actress, played King Lear. So it was a really, it was going to be something that I was really looking forward to. Um, first night we went there was the second time they'd ever performed it. And the first time they'd performed it was in May. And then everything shut down. And then they had a break of however many weeks in between. So it's been incredibly frustrating. I've had um, a couple of shows that have been postponed to December now, um, we do a, there's a lot of um, rehearsal 
on Zoom and a just this sort of feeling, you know, is is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Mm-hmm. There's this general sort of um, feeling of are things going to pick up? Um, the arts here, I think, has been um, really neglected. Sport seems to um, be the most important thing um, down here in Melbourne, and I probably David would say the same um, up in up north in, in Australia that the arts seem to have been forgotten. And it's, it's very, very depressing, actually. So, yeah, that's that's the state of nothingness, really. But people are still holding on to hope. What about you? What about you, David? How's it going up north in, in Australia? Yeah, we're not in, fortunately, unlike Melbourne, we're not in uh, lockdown, but I myself, yeah, uh, Three festivals last year that I normally work in were, and um, you, you're sort of right. Our country's, um, I suppose, this sport has been made to any situation, really. But um, yeah, a lot of artists. I know a Melbourne-based artist escaped from Victoria and is living in my old home, Mackay, and he's trying to. He, he usually does large um, blues type music and he's had to relocate and he's doing pub work in, in a small town. So um, they're doing jazz under the arts in Cairns um, and there's a, there's a little bit of a scene, but theatre people um, are trying to do some shows and uh, small theatres, but yeah, certainly the major productions have been put on hold and um, uh, we just don't know. I, I flew down to our capital Brisbane to do a um, performance down in the Italian community and everything was fine. And then the night that I flew, the government shut the whole the whole um, sector down and I had to turn around in a hurry and escape Brisbane. So I've um, I've had to experience a, a little bit of what Claire's gone through, not as much because we haven't been in lockdown certainly as much, but also um, international projects are being um, rescheduled or, or postponed as well. So um if if the governments of the world um yeah sort of can make allowances for stadium uh, events you wonder why it's always been a question in my mind over the period of why they can't do social distancing at the theaters um just as just as well as they can, can enter the stadium and um and why actress actors and that can't be on stage even distancing a little bit more and still it's still going on but i think we're learning. We're learning how the, the the processes work and how lobbying works and and how politicians probably um, make things. You know, that the, the A-listers um, still travel. The politicians still travel anywhere they want, anytime, and um, the, and sporting stars and artists not so much. So, I guess that's that's saying it plain. And um, I, I hope for. I know artists have gone to. Um, that were performing quite regularly and, and pursuing their careers have turned to all sorts of other types of work. Um, I, I know a trumpet player, a friend of mine, a, he's a band leader in Brisbane, he used to run a, a cabaret at the Art Deco Orchestra. And he he actually ended up in hospital um, in a psychiatric ward because because of losing um, work, losing his, out, his outlet of music. And um, he just, yeah, kind of lost the plot. So yeah, people are doing it tough. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you know, it, it's um, what's going on here in America is is uh, it's very bizarre because yes, there is the COVID um, pandemic going on, but then at the same time, it got hyper politicized, and so even so, the government really doesn't. If the government did decide to do a lockdown, it wouldn't half of the people wouldn't obey it. I I mean, it's, 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 um, you know, I I was in a meeting, a face-to-face meeting several weeks ago, and I was there um, with a colleague and a studio director and a parent of um, some children in that studio. And, you know, as you do in Switzerland, you introduce yourself and say the languages you speak because they have four national languages. And so by everybody sharing what language they speak, then they know what language the conversation will be in. Well, now you say, you know, I say, well, I'm Ken and I've I've had both of my 
you know, Moderna jabs, you know, and, and went around the circle. And, and I said that a colleague, you know, said that he had had his jabs. The director of the studio said she had her jabs. And the mother said, um, you know, I'm so-and-so and I'm covered. Three or four hours that night, I found out that the mother didn't qualify for getting her vaccine because she was only one week from being active symptoms of COVID Delta variant. And when she said she was covered, I guess she meant that she was, her body was developing antibodies because she was sick at the time. Later that night or the next morning, we found out that the studio director, even though she had been double vaccinated, was sick with COVID. And then my colleague and I, we went into our own private lockdown. Um, I, I got, actually, I got sick, but it wasn't COVID. It, I tested negative for COVID, but I, I got a very bad cold. Um, but it was one of those quick tests. So, you know, it, it may be. Anyway, so here in Arizona, it's, it's the Wild West. Now, in terms of the arts, when we were about two thirds of the way through a remodeling reconstruction of a new facility when COVID hit, we have still yet to be able to get workers in to finish the remodeling. Um, I have been teaching 20 classes a week on Zoom. And um, I even choreographed about two thirds of a new work that was a solo. And then it just got it just got too crazy to keep trying to do rehearsals with dancers all over the world. Um, but four or five months ago, when things seemed to be getting better, we scheduled a live gala at a theater here in Arizona. And it is scheduled for September 11th. And we're going ahead with it. Um, uh, we're going to, of course, have social distancing in the theater and masks and all that. We're also doing a live feed of the gala. And it's a fundraiser because since we aren't open, we can't pay our rent. And so we're doing this fundraising gala to be able to pay the rent um, to keep our facility that has sat empty now for almost two years. Um, so it is a very big problem. Um, I just learned yesterday that, that we have a four-year contract with the Japanese corporation to complete the development of the Ballet Neiroi, um, which is for uh, to honor Margot Fontaine's um, celebration in 2019. And it still hasn't been able to be held because of COVID and all the postponements. Anyway, that is now being pushed back a year. That four-year project is going to start in 2023. However, I'm reminded of a letter exchange between um, Igmar Bergman and Miss uh, Herr Heigl, his manager, um, in 1939. And um, Heigl wrote to um, Bergman um, saying that he really hoped the liberals won because when the fascists are in power, it's terrible for the arts. And Igmar Bergman wrote back, uh, you know, my friend, you're wrong. When the liberals are in charge and it's good for the arts, everybody is an artist, including usually the most talentless people. When the fascists are in charge, all of those people who are pretending to be artists run and hide and only the really dedicated artists remain doing their work, and that is when we find our voice. And I have that effect. If you think about who the group, who your group was, and colleagues, when this all started, and look at who they are now. They're that have gone and done other things. You know, they've dropped off of the face of the arts for now. I have artist friends who I, 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 I was shocked that when it was first announced, they quit their job as artists and they got signed up as real estate agents and medical tech and, and, and IT and all that. Immediately, they just wanted to have a job. You know, they didn't even try to stay doing something in the arts. But I think that that's been a very good weeding out. 
you know, um, only the most dedicated have remained. Because like your friend, I am, I'm heartbroken for your friend, David, but like your friend, if, if an artist, if a true artist doesn't do their art, they, they lose their mind or they lose their heart or they lose their way. You know, they asked Martha Graham, the modern dance pioneer in America, what kind of person she looked for to work with as a dancer. Was it somebody who had really good flexibility or was very strong? And she said, none of those things. She said, I can teach people those things. What I look for is somebody who, if they don't dance, they'll die. Those are the ones I work with. And, and I believe at the end of this COVID, we will have weeded out and we will know who the really true, dedicated, from the depth of their soul artists are. That is my belief, and that is what I see happening. Um, Pipo, how? What is your take on all of this? It's a conversation and some contributions of you that make me think and make me feel strongly for what you have mentioned. It's very emotional, and I feel like a lots of emotions also that appear and then i remember what happened to me that i was working on an editing for the quarantine training that was offered by mfab that was an initiative to have training offered as quickly as possible because a dancer every day that a dancer doesn't take class they lose what they have been working on, but they don't lose a day, they lose a week. So when a, a dancer use, loses a, a week, they actually take a month to get back. And then when you lose a month, then it takes you a year, you know? So you cannot miss class. And there's a dancer who said, I don't need class. And then a ballerina answered, then the dance doesn't need her, mm -hmm. you know? So it's harsh and the same time it's a reality. So mm -hmm. I was doing editing and then there was this, I, I tried to remember, it was a girl in New Zealand and she was doing the bar and she had the, the phone on the bottom of the bar. And, and I thought, hey, hold on, and I got up, you know, and then I was like, I'm gonna try that, you know? And then, you know, we did a, a port de bras, you know, and a plie and another one. And I was like, well, that's really nice. And I started to do the next exercise, which I was supposed to edit. And I ended up doing a whole bar. So a ballet class, you have a bar. And sometimes you have some exercises in between. Bar is to prepare you for the center. So on the total length of the, of the class, like 50% or 30% or, you know, depending on who teaches it. So I ended up doing the whole bar. And the next day I ended up in a Zoom video conference preparing for a class. So I started taking class again and I'm um, 42 years old this year, so last year. I was 40, that was before my 41st birthday. And I hadn't planned to be dancing again because of uh, a rheumatoid arthritis that, you know, forced me into retirement 31. And there I was taking class again. And in, as incredible as it is, I took class for more than a year. So I, I'm incredibly lucky because I happened to be in an environment where an offer was made and by accident, um, I, I was able to join or see that or discover that. And then also I felt very kind of accepted because having dance as a professional, I was afraid of the way I was looking like because I haven't taken class for nine years. And I remember that I stopped taking ballet class in 2007. So I started again in, in 2020 
So I did other classes, but I haven't taken ballet class in 13 years, which is like, it takes 95 years to get back to where I was. Imagine that. And um, in that way, um, of course, I felt really stupid, you know, not being able to do the exercises the way I remembered I would be able to do it. And also being a professional in my field, I'm used to perform only the best quality. And if it isn't the best quality, I'm not going to make it public. So these classes were online classes. And every time we went online, I thought, oh, man, it's horrible to having to present publicly my state of training. I, I'm not used to that. So usually you need to imagine that a ballet class is a private thing. This is not a public thing. This is to prepare for rehearsal. It's to prepare for a performance, but this is not a thing that, that lives from judgment or from outside comments. And suddenly I was in a public class that had worldwide distribution with dancers from all over the world. And I mean, I guess I was trying to compensate by good clothing, <laughs> you know, or anything that helps. But as a matter of fact, that's a personal problem I had. But as I mentioned, you know, it, it was an emotional state of, of working on something I hadn't been planning on working. So a lot of the past year has been doing things that I had never thought I would be doing. It was out of my imagination that I would be in a in a private space um, doing a transmission for a public. How embarrassing, you know, me showing myself in like, oh my God, and the plies and the tondis, all those exercises, you know, because language used for the single steps and then each step um, and any time you do them, you want to have them perfect. So the kind of experience I went through, but it brought back the wish to do something that is substantial and that speaks to the people out there. And as Ken mentioned, it also happened to me that people disappeared. You know, people I'd been working with for years, suddenly they said, I can't continue to do regular meetings. I can't commit to schedules. Um, I was in video conferences and, and, and many, 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 many talks about money, but talking about content in my surrounding only happened with those artists who kept on working. And I'm lucky because that made me survive. I, I suddenly re-found my tribe that before I had my tribe when I was in in university training to be a dancer. That was family, you know? Suddenly people doing the same thing. You have a pianist, there's live music, and everybody is working on something to do something together. Mm. And suddenly there we were, you know, everybody at home, but connecting and working on projects and having regular meetings. And this is really the moment that those who show up you know, they decide. And um, I thought, can is that harsh to say there's a weeding out? And in the same time, that's what happened already. There's been weeding out happening. And every professional relationship is also a little bit like a normal, like the people I work with in the arts, I feel very connected to them. And it's been tragic, you know, I miss them. However, I don't know what else to do than to say, well, you know, if, 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 if they can't make it anymore, if they're not available anymore, um, if they're not answering to the emails, if they're not answering to their phones, if it's too difficult to make a planning, then the only thing is to move on and that was very difficult to move on and accept that 
some things now are in the past. So I think there's a pre-COVID and a past COVID kind of world. Hmm. Claire, you did a, a series produced in your homes, you and another actress, um, yeah. that was incredible. And that was something that I don't think ever would have happened. You know, looking no. at the positive side, yes, there is so much loss, but we are creative people and humans are survival animals, you know? And so we found our way. Talk about that at that um, production and okay. maybe give the people the link if, if you can, if it's still available, it's it's truly worth watching every single episode. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ken. Um, well, actually that was- You can was... pay me my 15% later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In Australian dollars, it'll get you nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, um, well, I, I was actually, we were, Prior to COVID, we were going into a rehearsal for a play, um, and this is with um, a woman. Her name's Marie Actress, and she's in her 80s. And um, COVID started to happen an hour out of Melbourne, um, the city of Melbourne. So in sort of um, a little country town. So for her, travelling back and forth to Melbourne was going to be a bit difficult. And, you know, at that stage, none of us knew how this pandemic was going to play out. So um, whilst whilst we were sort of on hold, um, waiting to see how long this COVID shutdown thing would take, Brenda and I got together and just started reading over the scripts that were meant to be um rehearsing for and after a while we got so bored with it because uh, it was sort of just the two of us and there wasn't you know no no director and what have you so we started looking at other projects and other little plays that we could just read and keep ourselves engaged and um out of that um there was one little um it was a sort of an exchange between um two people a very short play i think it was about two pages and it was about the whole thing of when you're you know when you're talking with people and we have those exchanges now and then you know you constantly you know oh sorry I've got to take this phone call and what have you and it became it was quite a comedic script so we um we adapted it to zoom and called it zooming with mother it is on youtube I think um and it was just purely improvisation so every week we got together we uh, decided on a through story for these two characters so Brenda played my mother um, I was the eldest of three of her daughters and what was really interesting is that I have an elderly mother and um, Brenda has three daughters and so it was kind of like life imitating art imitating life imitating art and um, we just did a, a sketch, sketches about the relationships between people, particularly when they're in um, a Zoom situation and, you know, you're distracted by things and um, family stuff's going on and, and um, relationships are tense and everything. Anyway, it, it was really for us to have fun and to keep ourselves um, creative and... Um, I posted a couple on Facebook and we just got so many comments of people saying, hey, can't wait for the next episode. So it, 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 it evolved from that. What's interesting, Ken, is um, tomorrow we're thinking of doing a second episode and it's this one's called An Actor Prepares. So, you know, um, taking, taking a bit of a, a thing from Stanislavski's An Actor Prepares, um, we're going to see where this goes and it will be another it will be another improvised sort of zoom you know three minute grab of <laughs> who knows what i wouldn't say that either of us are comedians but it, it tends to be comedic and um yeah it's been a lot of fun but be, getting back to that thing that you said people about um finding a tribe i've certainly found my tribe too um and also, you know, this whole COVID thing has given me the opportunity to reread plays or 
actually think, oh my God, I've never read such and such, you know, given me a chance to, to do some research, some personal homework and um, absolutely wonderful in that way. And, and to creatively see how you can, which is quite foreign to most of us, you know, to, to well, I founded, co-founded um, a theatre company called Anthropocene Play Company um, just before COVID with two other extraordinary women. And we haven't really had a chance to actually perform anything yet. We we're meant to be uh, doing a show for Melbourne Fringe Festival, which opens in October. It may or may not happen. We're just kind of wondering whether this show will go ahead. But um, we did a GoFundMe thing so that we could start this company. And one of the, one of the things that we offered was a company dance. Now, some of us are dancers and some of us are not. I'm clearly not a dancer. Um, but we're now having to choreograph it on Zoom and use the medium. And for most of us, it will be just an upper body experience <laughs> because <laughs> so it's going to be it's going to be interesting and fun and, you know, a new way of dealing with things. So, yeah, we, you sort of take an opportunity and fly with it and just go, okay, leap of faith let's let's just go where where we haven't been before and see what happens fantastic now david you know you're in the the music i know you've traveled i know you've done some performances but like you said you had the quick turn around and go back so you didn't get trapped in brisbane what what how does this conversation affect you inside of your music um at both as a performer and as a composer yeah, I've, um, I've been in the studio a bit lately. I've, I'm very fortunate that even though this is a very small, um, isolated northern town, um, the, there's a very good studio attached to the facility I work at. And I, um, I've just spent the whole week in there doing recordings um, and trying to get new, new microphones. And I'm, I'm getting deeper into the sound engineering things that like, in a normal year, I probably wouldn't uh, engage myself so much because I'd be like too busy or just worrying about a band or a festival performance. But when you um, when you've got the more time and you you've got a whole afternoon or a whole another day to follow up with it, and you've got a whole studio um, which is properly built and with equipment and all sorts of uh, gadgets, um, yeah, it sort of provokes your curiosity. So uh, yesterday. Um, this very very small town. Um, there's a there's a gentleman I've met who's actually uh, running the pool, the, the the town pool. But his background was um, building microphones for the BBC. So it's just amazing who's who you meet in, in the smallest of um, remote communities. That, so he was doing the microphoning uh, set up at the um, Royal Albert Hall for the proms. Um, some years back, and he was actually in a company designing um, the microphones. I know him through, through a completely different thing. I know him through pool hockey and, and scuba diving. And um, so we got talking and he came to the studio yesterday and he's got uh, very advanced things for testing equipment. And he's explaining to me and we went through all the recordings that I'm doing and, and some of the technical side of it. So. Um, I've, I've been able to do something in this uh, cut-off um, uh, community that I you know, haven't investigated before. And for me, it was fantastic because as a trumpet player, the, the microphone you on a, on a, um, in a recording, more from a, a music production that they'll I don't want to get too technical for our listeners, but basically with the electronics uh, of modern microphoning and, and, and focus perhaps on singers and focus perhaps on um, guitarists and things that the the technology that the brass players would have used um, becomes rarer and rarer to find people know anything about it. So um, I'm going, I'm doing back to the future. I'm using ribbon mics and for people who don't know what I'm talking about, it's it's the microphone that they would have used in, on CBS when they did live 
uh, radio broadcasts from Radio City in New York. When they had the orchestras, would come up, Artie Shaw's and Benny Goodman's and Harry James. So we're talking 1930s, I suppose, that kind of technology. And um, it's, yeah, it's just been a, a completely uh, stimulating time for me, especially, and I've also now through this gentleman that's in this small town, he's going to introduce me to a violin player, a young lady and, and her other lady friend who plays cello. So I'm talking about a community of about 2,200 people, very mm -hmm. remote from any capital city. And yet these people are classically trained and they do a sort of a, a genre of um, classical, but they mix it with rock music and pop music. So I'm very excited, hopefully, to meet them in the next coming weeks. And we might talk about uh, collaborations, projects and recordings. And, and this is all happening in, in a very, very small remote village. Um, and I never would have expected the expertise and talent that's in, in the local community. Hmm. Um, Lungani, what about you? You know, you um, are a dancer, you are a choreographer, you are a producer, um, you know, and, and you have so many different hats. How has this whole thing been for you? Okay, all right. Um, how are you? How old are you? What do you like? What is your favorite color? No, um, <laughs> no as you connect your microphone, um, uh, David, if you want to reach across into the next square and help him with his technology, people, you can help too. Um, the, um, yeah, figure of right, Mark. <laughs> uh oh, earthquake in Alanisos, Greece. Um, but um, no, no, I mean, you know, you have, of course, Okay, now you can answer the question that I never got to finish, but how is that for filler? <laughs> <laughs> Just what my dad distorted. I'm going to have to be on my own uh, for this one because I, <laughs> I didn't know I was part of the conversation. I was just, you know, um, listening to, I thought it was a legend's talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, as a young person who is, you know, um, I call myself an, an upcoming or, or legend, legend in the making. <laughs> but uh, since I'm having this opportunity to sit in the same table with the legends and, and have a, a conversation, um, well, yes, it has been, it, it has been very hard. Um, you know, one thing that has been helping me a lot um, is is, is is being connected you know um i know a lot of us as artists we we naturally connected um because you know art it keeps us connected in a way i don't know i cannot describe this but i i know from an experience it's it's hard to take it into um to tr to translate it into words but um yeah i've been doing a lot of uh prayers I've been connecting to the spirits and um, I've been using this time to try things that I've always wanted to try and I didn't have time. Um, uh, for instance, I will make a simple example with, uh, with me and, me and my, my dad. He's, he's also a dancer and he travels. He's an artist actually and he travels a lot. He never got time, you know, to spend um, with with family because month after month and week after week he would travel and you know I, I i'm the same too you know once i start traveling i travel and i would go home for only like a few days like three days and i'll go back to somewhere in a different country um so i am this kind of a young man who always try to find good where you know most of the people they think it, there's bad you know so i always try to find something good and um and to explore there's a lot of things that we can do as human beings but because we don't have time or because we are stuck in just one thing that we think that we were brought here on earth for we don't know what other things we can do as human beings. So I always use this kind of time to explore and do things. I know there's a lot of challenges that are there 
um, I haven't been on stage for like, I don't know, three, uh, two years or so, I don't know, I haven't performed for a larger audience in a long time. And I think, and I believe that's where I get my energy from, you know, so, which is why I decided, okay, let me just go and, and get some energy um, from, you know, um, for, from the spirits, you know, it could be anything, you know, if you it could be meditation, meditation, uh, it could be a prayer, it could be going to church, it could be, you know, whatever that you believe in and whatever that fulfills um, your, your desire. If you want to gain energy and, and pick yourself up, pick yourself up and never lo lose hope, then I would, you know, advise somebody out there who's watching that you should find something that you can always have access to wherever you are. You know, I have access to prayer wherever I go. I can pray when I'm in, in a plane, as long as it's something that makes me feel good and I'm able to access it anywhere. You know, I know we are very talented. Sometimes we don't have access to studios. We don't have access to audiences. We don't have access to um, internet. You know, when all of these things are not present, what do you look up to? So I, I managed to find that um, during these crazy times, you know, um, it was really bad. It is still bad, but um, I think I found a treasure. I found something that I can hold on to and something that can give me hope uh, whenever I feel like, you know, it's the end of the world, you know, I, I, I connect. So, yeah, I mean, th that's, I wasn't ready for this one, but yeah, that's what <laughs> kept me going. Yes, it was hard. I, I, I absolutely agree with you guys. There's a lot of things going on and um, not all of us are spiritual. Not all of us believe in, in meditation, prayer or connecting to nature or anything that has to do with that. And I, I really, I can imagine how bad it is for those kind of people, you know, because they just you know, sitting around, waking up in the morning, looking at the same old face, Lungani's face, and you're like, hey, bro, I'm tired of looking at your face now. Can you, <laughs> you know, can you, you know, shift away from me? I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Being, being indoors for too long on its own is just a, it's just a disease on its own, you know. So, um, yeah, having to find something to do, keep yourself busy, even if you think of, you know, creating a phone from scratch, like ask yourself, how do they build a phone from scratch? You know, take an old phone, unscrew it and look, have a look at what's inside. You never know, maybe it's your calling, maybe you, were, you are a technician, you know? <laughs> I don't know, you can, you know, rather than trying all these crazy stupid things out there that's gonna put you in trouble, you can try and upgrade your skills and try other things, you know? Um, well, that's, that, that's, that's for me, but obviously, because I'm the one who's talking, that's why I'm saying you, but it goes to me, you know. If you want to take it, you can take it. If you don't want to take it, <laughs> you don't have to take it. But yeah, this is, this is, very, this is a very dangerous time because it, it deals with emotions and feelings. And um, yeah, you know, when something hurts on your skin or on your physical, it's, it, you know, you, you, can, you can deal with it, you know. But when something hurts emotionally or you know, um, I don't know, mentally creates a confusion. It, it, it's, it's something that hurts and it's really hard to cure it, you know, or to run away from that pain, in which is why, um, you know, my alternative is, is, is being connected, um, trying spiritual things. That's how you get the healing from something like that, I believe. So I will hand over to uh, people or someone else who wants to uh, people, if I can just jump in on you just for one second, I just want to say um, that I started traveling internationally as a dancer when I was 14. Lungani, my son, he started traveling internationally when he was 14, 15. And it is a blessing. You know, I know for all of you out there who are stuck at home with the family that you're at home with all the time, for people like us who are traveling artists, this has been a treasure to really spend time together as a family because because we're all over the world all the time and that has been um for ha half of lungani's life 
And so um, I just wanted to underscore that from my side too, this time of being able to be home, you know, I decided that it would be really nice to sort of like make, do a lot of cooking in the kitchen and everything. Lungani decided it'd be really nice to create the Global Sundays. Um, so, um, you know, whatever that says, <laughs> anyway, Pipo, I, I didn't mean to, to jump on your, your slot there, but I just wanted to, to say, you know, this has been a treasure in many ways for us personally and our family, but go ahead, Pipo. Two things. First of all, Lungani couldn't agree more. Um, I lived with my parents for six months after the pandemic started. So I left my, my place and I, I got a rental car and that was just a decision from one day to the other. And it's been such a blessing to be able to reconnect because I moved out, out when I was 19. And so I came back when I was 40 and certainly I lived out of home longer than I've and that means that then we have changed and we've grown and and we have different habits and and suddenly I was able to experience living with my parents again and that is such a gift that is just amazing and secondly I got reminded of all those people who had to continue to go and work because they can't afford to stay at home. And I really need to feel, I, I feel, give a big, you know, something, I don't know how you call that Lungani, you're better with those words. It's not a shout out, but my, my heart, um, from my heart really saying to those who keep on going and keep on working and, and supporting and, 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 feeding their families you know in this incredibly difficult situation despite the fact that wealthy persons like i consider myself i'm i'm very lucky that i can stay at home and also there's a joke an editor in the pandemic and then an editor not in the pandemic and it's the same picture <laughs> you know when i'm doing editing i'm doing it on my own anyway so i felt um it's incredible what what so many billions of people have done in this time and many have lost their lives so um there's something that i wanted to share and that's uh, david and i we have started talking about a composition it, that, that was before the pandemic started in November 2019. And, it, and it's another example of how, as Ken, I think, said, or Lungani or, or Claire, or I don't know, the arts keep you together. And very often projects develop over a very long period of time. So we have started talking about a composition that David sent me in 2019. And I still remember listening to it on a balcony in Dusseldorf and I was spending time there at a friend's place and I, I just touched me so much this composition we started having a regular exchange about music and things and and topics and that turned into a kind of collaboration but a collaboration that came from correspondence you know regular correspondence over works of arts so i had an idea and, and david came back one day he sent me a notation of a new solo and i was like whoa, whoa, whoa hold on what's going on you know so, so it's incredible that an, an artist you know he just sat down and had the inspiration to write a solo and then he found someone in France and got it recorded. So just a couple of days later, he sends me a recording of that solo. And all that started because we'd been talking about an, uh, an, an, a topic that is dawn. So when the day breaks, 
before the sunset the, the, and the light starts and the power of a day starting again. And as we were talking about it, I also spoke to other people about it. And, and suddenly there was this thing going on and it's not about funding or it's not about, or it's not about for me, it, it's like, I felt, oh my God, David, he really understands what I'm talking about, the need and the want to do something about this phenomenon that we all grow up with. A new day, a new beginning, no matter what happened before. And his way of, uh, apart from listening to my, you know, stuff was composing. And, and that's, that's truly amazing. <laughs> David, uh, I believe that the, the hot potato is in your hands. <laughs> very hot potato. Hey, Bo, um, you, you listen better than I do. Um, so I gave, it was the first lockdown even up here in the north. And, um, you know, you got weekends and weekends and, and even the, the school where I work at, there were students sent away and everyone's, it's like a ghost town. So yeah, so um, being close to the natural elements up here, uh, frame forest and, and reef, barrier reef and everything. Um, we have beaches and of course you go early morning riding and you'll see the sun coming up as you do. And you can understand why the Japanese have a particular um, reverence for the, for the beginning of a day because um, that's why they put the rising sun on their on their flag. It's um, if you really stop to think about it, and if you're up early enough to witness it, the the rising sun over an ocean, but in particular, is absolutely magnificent. And uh, those that have been in Africa probably can talk it more, and I've experienced it as well about the setting sun, an African setting sun or a desert sun over the Arabian desert. Um, so, I said uh, it's just a, it's a very simple phenomena that, that occurs every day. A lot of us are still sleeping if we're sensible, but um, those of us that do get up a bit early for either for exercise or, or to be out can witness. And you, you'll see the sky change a whole um, array of colors that goes into dark shadows, start forming in purples and things. So um, I guess as a musician and as an artist, you get inspired to try to um, express that in a, in a music sense. And as Pepo said, there's, it wasn't driven out of, oh, there's, there's a government grant on offer if you can do something local and, and it gets some sort of a claim and there's an outcome that seems to be what the arts funding. And I think that's another topic we could, we could um, unpack if we're interested on, on this morning show or this evening show, wherever you are. Um, so as an artist, as, as I said to Pepo at the time, I said, you either you either capture the moment when you're in the moment or you or you somehow try to um, reflect on it five years or ten years later um, if, you, if you're able to if you're in the moment if you're in the in the environment where you're being inspired and you can you can you can start expressing the art that's very um, a cathartic experience and you may not you may or may not use that piece of music as a composer, you may not, you may not see the light of day, and that's a bit of funny when you talk about the sun rising up. Um, it may not see the light of day for for a decade. But um, I'm I'm also working with Pepo. He's doing a podcast series, um, which is quite an interesting thing. He he can describe it in better detail. But basically, it's artists that have been in Germany, particularly in Germany, years now, and and. Than them reminiscing and doing sort of like uh, their experiences. And so uh, people asked me to work on him with some music for the podcast. Um, some of the music that, that we're looking at is, is archive stuff that I've, I've, I have to remember, but it might have been 10 or 15 years ago. It was either recorded or, or thought about or performed somewhere. So 
in my whole career up to date, <clears throat> a lot of my music is in is in the what they call the bookcase or the filing cabinet or the or the archive of the National Australia or etc. Never never seeing the light of day. It's um, another reference to Dawn. Um, but I think I think what I'm trying to say is that. Um, if you're if you're at home and you're an artist, it might be a, a picture, or you're on holiday, or you've got some sort of um, uh, thing going on where you're stimulated by a, by a situation or a context. Um, don't don't wait five years if you if you've got the time. Um, go go to the the easel and start your sketches. Um, or if you're a, a choreographer or, for, or, a, or a playwright, start putting some ideas down. Don't worry too much. Um, I'm starting to see more and more as I get older this this what they call the art they call it the art business paradigm where where people think that they can um, establish themselves as, as as commercial commercially successful artists and as much as we need to be pragmatic and pay our bills and, and have money coming in and it's it's really nice to, to get some money um, the artist can't really wait for that type, sort of business commercial timing. Um, in fact, for a composer in particular, and it's very historical um, reflection, is that a lot of the, the music um, that we write is is in a way ahead of its time. People, the, the audiences and people may not even be ready to uh, really take things on. And I, I can just make you know, references to um, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and things that were they were throwing um, you know, fruit and, and also... Um, in um, Czechoslovakia, um, Dvořák's and, and other works um, that were, were thrown out of, out of the house. Uh, Mozart had the same problem. Uh, Mozart wrote a piano concerto and um, the, the, the two people that had uh, commissioned him walked out in disgust. It was about 10 years after his death that it came to its prominence. So um, I think there's plenty of references in history for artists that if you seize the moment, Mozart sat down and wrote that piano concerto in, in, in the um, in the real time that he was in, and, and, and now it's one of his most prominent works. So um, that's what I, that's what Pipo is kind of talking about is that there's um, there's a need for artists to seize the moment. Um, the money, the the paradigm of where oh well there's funding available, therefore this is what they're looking for. This is what the, the, the judging panel of the, the arts people want. This is what I need to um, put into my art. That, that in a way, pollutes the process. Um, so, yeah, it's got me thinking. And, and I know that we've started Dawn. I know it's been world-class recorded. I know that Pepo's done a beautiful footage from Dusseldorf, as he said, from his arena. It actually times absolutely beautifully with the sun rising um, on the horizon, and I know, I know it will come to its fruition and, and be put on display. In fact, this year I presented works that I'd written nearly 20 years ago. So I'd written them in, in the desert of Arabia. I was in the moment, and um, I've only had one one um, performance of these chamber works. They've been sitting dormant for nearly 17 years, and then this year uh, a digital option to have music to go with a um, what they call a digital um, graphics display that went for about 13 minutes and that that music's been playing over and over for seven weeks um, from that actual concert and it's chamber music written 17 years ago and now it's seen a lot of day so um, I, I don't want all my works to be um, posthumously presented and I have no <laughs> some sort of benefit or, or being there on the spot with it but um, that's what my message is to people, and that's what Pepo is, I think, trying to talk about, is that artists need to seize the moment. And um, COVID has given some of us an opportunity to reflect and seize the moment and also find other genres for outlet. Yeah. Claire, what is your um, well, follow, perspective? Following on from that, um, I don't know if it's necessarily acting or, or just being creative, but... Um, Following on from what both Pipo and David said, and Lungani actually, um, we all need to connect. We all need to feel that need to connect. And whilst that wonderful feeling of being on stage, whether you're a dancer, a musician, or, you know, um, a, a, an actor, 
uh, and, and feeling the energy of the audience is extraordinary. I think we can find it in um, in the little things that are, you know, sort of in the minutiae of life. You know, the old saying, um, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. Well, last week I was handed a basket of lemons <laughs> from my from my neighbour, not not too many streets away, like an extraordinary a bunch of lemons. And um, I did make lemonade. I also made lemon chicken and I also made lemon meringue pie and I, I made quite a number of things. But it, it inspired me to think about that beautiful sense of sharing. We all need to share. We all need to share what it is. And so for my neighbour to give me those lemons was something beautiful. I was able to, you know, hand back a lemon cake to them and say thank you. But um, yesterday I had this wacky idea that um, our next door neighbours who are beautiful and Greek actually people um, gorgeous gorgeous family um, I, I suggested to my son that why don't I um, create a dish and send it next door and they have to reciprocate with a dish so we cook for each other and hand over you know a one pot casserole or whatever with a topic of conversation that they have to have at their dinner table <laughs> that is inspired by us and it has to do with either lemons or, or uh, art or, or theatre or, you know, whatever. And they also reciprocate with a topic of, com of conversation that we have to have at our place and then report back. Now, I haven't, this is only sort of formulaic in my head at this stage, but um, it's that kind of thing where as artists you, you don't stop thinking about how you can, make connections with people so that there is an exchange of energy and an exchange of ideas that go back and forth. And that's the beauty of doing what you're doing, David, with your music and people and the collaboration that uh, we're not stifled. We're somehow not stifled by it. It's just, it comes out in different manifestations um, because if we wait, for the day when it's the perfect day to, it might it might be irrelevant. I um there's a play that um that is written by an Australian um, playwright Barry Dickens, who's a very quirky, um, extraordinary. I know him, um, and it, it's called The Death of Minnie. And it was a about a woman who lived in St Kilda, which is in Melbourne. And she was lamenting, it was just prior to her wanting to commit suicide. So it's, it's quite a dark piece, but it's also very, very funny. I had it on my bookshelf, you know, thinking, oh, I'd love to perform, you know, The Death of Minnie. It's a solo piece. Um, and I picked it up as one of the plays that I wanted to reread again and realised that I'm actually 20 years old, too old now to play this damn part. So... <laughs> It's kind of it gave me that that real wake up call of don't wait just just do something just just act on your in, your little inspirations and they will lead to something else and all of a sudden you've created something that you never you never would have imagined could have happened so yeah I guess that's that whole thing about art can't be art can't be killed. Uh, you know, as artists, we we continue to look for something that inspires us. Um, yeah, on every day. I don't know if I've made any sense. I think I'm rambling. It's <laughs> what five thirty in the morning now. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's something that is is anybody who is watching this. Um, I hope that inside of your head or back of your head or bottom of your heart or something you get the idea i mean if you're watching this you already think art is important but if you start to connect with the fact that art is our civilization it is our culture it is our community it is our interaction with with each other and with nature and with our own spirit selves you know um if, you know we that is what art is, fine art. 
commercial art is, as David was saying, you know, you, you, the, the grant is there, these are the parameters of the grant, and so all of the artists who want the money have to jump to that tune and produce that thing. Well, that's commercial. Fine art is when it comes from inside of you, and it's something that must be expressed, and it's worthy of expression. Um, our guest later today, Spongira Ngroma, is an opera singer, but she has had many, many parts of her life. Um, she even had training as a lawyer. Um, she uh, was in a situation, um, I don't know exactly when it started, I think it was back in April or May or something like that, that, that the um, National Council for the Arts in um, South Africa, and please translate that to whatever it's actually called, um, the uh, National Council was um, not giving, not delivering grants that were given to artists. And artists, you know, as, as most of us have said, you have to act, you have to do it. You, you know, if you wait, it, it, it's not gonna happen. And, um, and so once there is a grant, and also people have no idea how much time and effort it takes to do the simplest thing if it's a fine art form. And um, what was happening was that the artists were being given grants, but they had to get started working. And so they would take out a second mortgage, they would take out a loan, they would, so that they could go forward knowing the money was coming. And so, um, and then there were of all of these millions of rand that were going to be given to the arts, but then who got them? Where did they go? What, you know, um, Spongiri Ngoma got together with a bunch of um, her collaborators, her fellow artists, her tribe, as we've said here. And they went to sit in the offices until somebody could answer some of those questions. And that turned into a very long and very globally prominent ordeal. When Spongile joins us later, um, and we were constantly traveling, um, you're gonna hear about that. Um, and so there is a, there is, there's two sides of this. As David said, as Claire has said, as people have said, as Langani said, and as I have said, when you feel inspired, that's the time to do it. And even if it doesn't get funded or if it doesn't, and in, in David's case, you know, um, in my estimation, David is, he is the 21st century and beyond in music. His way of composing music is extremely forward-looking and new, and it's reflective of the way life happens. Um, and he, he will talk about that. Uh, you know, most composition traditionally is what he calls vertical. It's a bunch of chords and then it's like pillars and you string the lights of the melody on those. But what David, his musicians are like people, each one going about their day and they all come together at Starbucks and then they go on about their day and other ones get together at family dinner. It's up there. Those are the chords, but they happen in a horizontal way. And that's the way choreography is. That's the way acting in a play is. It's the through line. It's, it's the wave of the ocean, not the, the solid shoreline that defines it. At any rate, um, to know that there are pieces that, that you wrote 17 years ago or even longer that are finally, even though they are in the National Archive and they are registered and all of that, they've never been heard. And so, if those hadn't been composed, when, you know, we say strike while the iron is hot, um, which is a blacksmith reference, but you know, if you hadn't done that, they wouldn't be here today. At any rate, um, I, I just wanted to say that when um, Spongile Nguoma joins us, you know, we're gonna be asking her about that, but I thought it might be nice now, um, as she's getting set up to actually listen to her operatic performance. Um, give us a, a, a chance to wet our whistles a bit. Um, and uh, if, if that's okay, Longani, I'm, I'm kind of I'm pushing the program here. I'm, I'm stepping out of bounds. Um, but if is that an appropriate thing? Okay, do we have an update on um, the progress of um, Madame Mguoma 
and her arrival at, at the place where she can join us. Okay, great. Enjoy this. You are watching Global Sundays. guest for today and we are still um, waiting for her uh, to give us an update with the NA we say arrival in Johannesburg South Africa but um, yeah while we're waiting for her um, I, I do know it's gonna be a really uh, lovely talk um, with with her because I remember I once I once had a chat with her and I think we were doing um, Miss Classics um event the online event the virtual event and uh, she's she's a powerful woman you know she's a powerful woman as um as you heard from the panelists that um some of them they had been you know they had a conversation with her and she's really amazing and um uh, one thing i like about her is that um most of the things that she does she doesn't only do it for herself but uh, she always think about people who are unable to voice out for themselves and um yeah and i like the fact that she's very um uh, versatile she's she's a talented lady who's versatile um who is a mother figure you know and and uh, yeah i'm i'm really um glad 
you know that I, I always meet people who who um unique and um they always contribute in a different way um in in one's life including my life yeah, which is really amazing but um i would just pass it over to um to our uh, panelists and I, and I know that um this coming week or next week there is going to be an event happening here um in in az and i know uh, mr Lagan touched on that a little bit but um yeah if maybe you, i'll see if we can give more uh, details if you are here in arizona and you'd like to see um you know a performance i know it, ha it has been a while there hasn't been anything going on but having something like this i think it's a treasure you've got to go and see this and um you know, I know I'll be busy, I'll be working, doing a lot of stuff, but I am going to be watching too. I'm not going to be performing, but I'll be watching too because I haven't seen something that is real, something that is like live, seeing people jumping and dancing and real people, not just television. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it over to my panelists. And also, I, I am going to be giving an entertainment update. I, I know people are working, they've been sending me their works well done to you guys um yeah it's good to see people pushing at this time during you know especially during this um trying times when people get up and do something and realize that okay this is this is to is taking longer than expected i gotta get up and do something um i really appreciate people who who um who thinks that way and um and yeah, uh, if you are at home also, you're still waiting to see or to hear when um, this situation is going to end. I would say to you, wait no more. Make a plan. Get up and do something. Like I said, it might, be a, it might sound like a joke when I say, take your phone. Open your phone and see what's, I what's in your phone. Y who knows? You might discover something new, something that you might fall in love with and start opening every phone that you see and then, you know, you start opening a business and people will bring their, their phones to you and you fix your phones. I mean, or maybe you might end up creating your own phone in which, huh, that's my idea. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> uh, let me pass it over uh, to Mr. Pike, uh, Mr. Laden, Claire and uh, people. Over to you guys, and welcome back. Well, you mentioned uh, what's going on in Arizona. Um, on the anniversary of Margot Fontaine's birth, which is May 18th, each year we make an announcement at the Margot Fontaine Academy. Um, and this year, um, we have been putting off her 100th birthday gala since it happened in 2019 because when in May of 2019, everybody was still traveling and very busy. So we had scheduled it for right really at the beginning of 2020. And of course, everybody knows what happened in 2020. So this last year to commemorate Margot's birthday, I announced um, my successor when I eventually stepped down um, to the Margot Fontaine legacy. And that is an incredibly brilliant dancer, Reiner a uh, featured guest of our show. We was in Vienna, Austria, filming about his life. Um, and we had incredible technical difficulties. The, uh, uh, I think it's called Sparklight Company that provides the internet um, for 19 states in the United States went dark that day. And so <laughs> we were gonna have to reschedule Reiner, but Reiner um, is an international um, ballet megastar. Um, currently, he is principal dancer at Miami City Ballet. He came out here um, once we had announced that he was my associate artistic director and would in what is the Fontaine legacy surrogate designate. Um, he did some workshops with local kids and he really fell in love with Prescott and he decided to do a, a gala bringing some of his friends. Um, at this gala, which will be a September 11th at the Ruth Street Theater, and that's on the Prescott High School campus, beautiful state-of-the-art theater, um, is uh, going to be Reiner. He's going to be joined from Miami, Tricia Albertson. Um, 
And then uh, principal soloist Hannah Fisher is going to be here performing. Also um, Jordan Elizabeth Long and Ashley Knox, also soloists. And then Renan Cartiero, who is a pr principal dancer at Miami and a brilliant dancer. I had um, several months that I was able to work with him in 2018, um, getting ready for the Edinburgh Festival. Um, brilliant, young, young, young new star coming um, up in the ranks of the ballet world will be here performing. And then also um, Machi Muto, principal soloist with the Georgian State Ballet in Tbilisi, who is the lower school director for Margot Fontaine Academy when we open. And Frank Van Tangeren, who is was a principal dancer with the Georgia State Ballet, and he is our upper school director. And so they will both be here um, dancing. The, the repertoire for this ballet um, gala was chosen by Reiner. Um, and he didn't want to just do tutus and toe shoes and all of that. So it's going to be some of the exotic, um, the Talisman Ballet um, by Maurice Petipa. Um, and uh, here you're seeing some of these dancers, the picture of them. Um, and also the Diana and Actian um, Pas de Deux, which is um, from a ballet. And it's about the, the god um, Actian, who is basically Hercules and mighty and powerful, and Diana, who is, um, you know, Cupid, is able to take him down with a little teeny arrow of love, which is a really wonderful, and it's the, 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 the fight to the finish that love can conquer. Um, that's going to be on the program. There's also the Swan Lake Pas de Trois. Um, there are so many different pieces. It's going to be in incredible. Now, for those of you around the world, you can attend. Um, there is a Facebook event um, and we will have the link posted. Um, I think that, uh, Longani, are you able to post that on our uh, diverse television website and, and all of that? Um, because I would try to read it to you, but it starts with HTTPS colon slash, you know, I'm not going to go through all that. Um, so, um, but that will be posted and you can, you can buy a ticket on that link. And the great thing about that is um, you don't have to watch it at two o'clock in the morning because if you buy a ticket, then from the day of the performance, we, you can watch the recording of that live feed for the next 15 days from the dates or through the 20s if you have a ticket you can watch this and um it is it's going to be extraordinary um there are many many aspects to it that i won't go into we are also going to be featuring local dancers that reiner met at workshops when he was here and they have created two works particularly for this gala. We have a localet, um, somebody uh, correct my French, chocolatier, chocolatier. That sounds like a three musketeers. Anyway, somebody who is an artist of chocolate, <laughs> her name is Tracy. Um, Tracy is creating uh, um, one big chocolate sort of masterpiece that we're gonna, they're gonna auction off um, to raise money from MFAB, but also she's going to create a particular smaller con confecture. Um, I don't know the words in English, the little, little treat. Um, bonbon, special, what is it, David? Confectionery. Confectionery. Isn't that when you go and tell the priest what you did in a dark room? <laughs> no, that's the room that you do it in then. Oh, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, but it's, it's going to be truly amazing and, and coming out of COVID and, and now remember this, what, what people said, if a dancer misses one day of class, it takes them a week to get back to the level they were before they miss a week. It takes a month. If they take, miss a month, it takes a year. These dancers have been on furlough for almost two years. But guess what? These are the dancers that have done class every single day, even in their living rooms, even hanging on to their balconies in their high rise Miami apartment buildings. Um, and thank God, none of them lived in the building that collapsed. Um, but maybe that was some dancer doing jumps. I don't know. 
Um, oh. but, uh, <laughs> that in bad taste. Sorry. That should be edited. No, no, maybe it. it'll go viral. <laughs> it'll just say B. Oops. Oops. Okay, so we've just gotten word that Spongile Mboma is going to be able to join us in five minutes. Um, so that is a bit about the the uh, um, the upcoming uh, gala that we're going to be doing. Um, does anybody, how do you want to spend our five minutes? Um, people, let's start with you. Yeah, um, thank you, Ken, for reminding me of the effects of jumping. Um, <laughs> it was a kind of melting. Uh, I was a very active child, but I used to climb up the, the, the doors because you have like the sides, you know, and I would go press my feet and hands against the doors to the sides and then go up and down. So um, that was my activity. I also thought that being in the arts reminds me of people having a child. Since I'm traveling at the moment with my mother, she can actually now see what happened with how she educated me 30 years ago by getting me into a um, gymnasium, it's called here, Lycée, it's in French and in the United States, I always get mixed up with college and high school and all of that, but that's five years after you have started school at the age of to study and is said to be a bad language. So that to study Latin for those now I can sit here in a panel and speak English. And just before we were talking in conversing in Italian and French, and I've had this incredible base on which I could build, but I wasn't aware of it at all at that age. And so thinking of what David says that you have something on the shelf, if you have a child and Claire, is a mother of 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 um, many children and can you've had children so you would do anything for the good of the child and even though it might take half a century that it has actually an outcome you wouldn't mind and i just thought that's pretty much how sometimes we relate to being an artist sometimes there are things we need to do and they might take quite some time until this message in a bottle is found or it comes out. But you would still do the best you can. Like you would want to be lovely and, and loving to your children. And you would say it's always worth doing the best, you know, even though you might have a bad day or, you know, you might have a, a little breath like, I've been uh, for quite some time. My parents were loving and supporting and, and they would want me to thrive and they would do the best. And now I sit here and I can converse in English and uh, I'm doing incredible projects. And it made me think that it's very much to, related to how you can look at the arts, that it's not related to invest uh, uh, upon return, uh, return upon invest and, and have a direct link of it needs to produce to be produced. And it, it's no, that's not how it goes. And that's not how it goes with a with a child. You know, you don't say, well, you know, you got to give me something back on my investment. <laughs> you, you don't do that, you know, and when you do, you pay a high price when you yeah. put these incredible kind of expectations. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful for, for all of you of making me aware of that. And also being able to be here and you've seen my, my mother, she was walking around and, you know, in, and, and because um, it's, and it's time also now to go to music video. So, um, Natim Ten from Natim Temple 
Okay, um, I'm working on my spelling and I, I will see you all back at the end of the video and probably with our guest. It's lovely to be here tonight and big shout out to all the followers. I'm reporting for Global Sunday News, I'm Kenneth Ludden. Today is August 29th, 2021. In our first segment of news today, we are seeing the results of lots of shifts and changes throughout the world and the reaction to those changes. Primarily, we're talking about Afghanistan and also the streak of just a lineup of hurricanes, major hurricanes, one after the other that are impacting the Caribbean and the southern United States, well, the entire United States. So um, here is our first news segment from the Global Sunday News, and we will talk to you again at the end of the news segment. We want to begin tonight in Afghanistan and the fallout 24 hours after that horrific suicide bombing. Tonight, we're beginning to learn the names, see the faces, and understand the heroism of the 13 fallen service members. Navy medic Max Soviak from Ohio. He graduated from high school in 2017. His mother telling ABC News he was very proud to serve his country. Marine Riley McCollum from just outside Jackson, Wyoming. Marine Kareem Nikoi, his father saying he loved what he was doing. He always wanted to be a Marine. And Marine David Espinoza from Laredo, Texas, a 2019 high school graduate. And Marine Hunter Lopez from California. Those who knew him saying being a Marine to Hunter wasn't a job, it was a calling. Some of those who died would have been too young to remember 9-11 and the start of the war in Afghanistan. President Biden today acknowledging their bravery and their sacrifice by calling this a worthy mission, saying we will complete it. It's a mission that's getting increasingly perilous, however. National security officials saying these final four days before the deadline will be the most dangerous yet and that another attack is likely. Tonight, we know roughly 500 Americans are left behind, but can the government get all of them out, as well as more Afghan allies? Our Ian panel leads us off tonight. Tonight, continuing chaos and danger at Kabul airport. Flashbang grenades fired to disperse increasingly desperate crowds as the urgency grows to evacuate Americans and Afghan allies from the country. Planes departing throughout the day as hundreds of people again swarm the airport, hoping to get out in the next four days. The Taliban using military vehicles to block some of the roads leading to airfield gates. The morning's begun for those killed in the deadly attack at Abbey Gate. 13 American service members and 170 Afghans lost their lives, 200 wounded. President Biden warned today by his national security team that another terror attack in Kabul is likely, calling the threat specific and active, and saying the next few days will be the most dangerous period to date. They are uh, taking maximum force protection measures at the Kabul airport and in the surrounding areas with our forces. But today, the president insisting that evacuation flights will continue. Our hearts go out to all those who we've lost. But look, um, the mission there being performed is dangerous. And it's, uh, now it's come with a significant loss of American personnel. And, uh, but it's a worthy mission. The Pentagon now revealing new details about what happened in the deadly suicide blast. The attack launched at 5.48 p.m. local time, immediately followed by gunfire from an unknown location. The military now clarifying only one explosion took place, not two, as initially reported. The Pentagon adding they're not sure how many service members died from the blast and how many from the gunfire, but revealing there were 11 Marines, one Navy medic, and one army soldier among the fallen. 
And tonight, we're starting to learn the identities of the Americans killed, including Navy medic Max Soviak of Ohio and Marines Riley McCallum of Wyoming, Kareem Nicoe and Hunter Lopez of California, and David Lee Espinosa of Texas. 18 Americans also wounded in the attack, some medevac to Germany in special surgical units inside C-17 planes. But the questions remain on just how this attack took place, with the Pentagon scrutinizing Taliban checkpoints. If they were able to get up uh, to the Marines at the, at the screening, at the, at the entry point of the base, there's a failure somewhere. It was a failure by, well, uh, you know, the Taliban operate with varying degrees of competence. Some of those guys are very scrupulously good, some of them are not. A photo from this week reveals just how dense the checkpoints can be. Dozens of service members within arm's length of those trying to get in. This is close-up work. The breath of the person you are searching is upon you. The president vowing to punish ISIS in Afghanistan, the group behind the attack. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. ISIS-K is made up of disaffected Taliban and foreign fighters, but they're the sworn enemy of the Taliban. Even so, hundreds of them escaped from prison as the Taliban released their own fighters during the rapid takeover of the country. In Washington, criticism mounting on the Biden administration for its handling of the evacuation amid reports that American identities were shared with the Taliban in an effort to expedite their evacuation from the country. Leading Republicans now demanding answers, but the State Department denying it's been done in a way that exposes anyone to additional risk. But as the backlash intensifies, the airlift goes on. Officials reporting just over 4,000 evacuated from the country in the past 12 hours, the lowest figure in a week. The State Department saying they're working another 500 Americans who still want to leave. We will be able to fly out evacuees right up until the last moment. That's going to be the goal. Today in Afghanistan, the U.S. striking back delivering on the promise of retaliation for a suicide bombing at Kabul airport 48 hours earlier. That left at least 169 dead, according to the Associated Press, including 13 U.S. servicemen. The target, an ISIS-K fighter believed to be involved in planning future terror attacks, according to two U.S. defense officials. He was riding in a vehicle in the Nangarar province in eastern Afghanistan, once an ISIS stronghold. The weapon of choice, an NQ-9 Reaper drone. A CENTCOM spokesman said the target is believed to have been killed with no known civilian casualties. But U.S. intelligence agencies fear that ISIS-K may strike again. The U.S. Embassy in Kabul again yesterday warning U.S. citizens to avoid traveling to the airport and to avoid airport gates. Despite those warnings, evacuations are still racing ahead. There are still Americans in Kabul desperate to get out before the U.S. deadline to finally leave Afghanistan on Tuesday. And next tonight, to a major threat brewing in the Gulf of Mexico, Hurricane Ida could make landfall in Louisiana as a major hurricane as soon as Sunday. So let's bring in our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano. Rob, time this out for us. Well, Juju, it's rapidly approaching the coastline. This thing has really only been on our radar for a few days, and it's already a hurricane lashing into western Cuba. Let's take a look at it. Uh, it's getting a little bit banged up with the land interaction there, but once it gets into the Gulf of Mexico, it's uh, all systems go. This thing is likely going to rapidly intensify. That's the warning out of the National Hurricane Center. That's what our, our computer models are saying. So many of them are not only saying it's going to rapidly intensify, but take this track, which brings it to the coastline of southeast Louisiana Sunday afternoon as a Category 4 four storm with 140 mile per hour winds. Of course, hurricane warnings have been posted from just west of Lafayette to the uh, Mississippi, Louisiana uh, border. Uh, and this is going to have when you're talking about Cat 4, you're talking about big time winds that will be damaging winds. We saw that with Hurricane Laura in southwest Louisiana last year. And we're also dealing with a big time surge, 10 to 15 feet in that area. And if you're outside the levee system and they're telling people to evacuate right now inside the levee system, you'll be tested with that uh, sort of surge and also going to be tested with the amount of rainfall coming in with this 10 to 20 inches of rainfall near New Orleans and uh, that sort of rainfall is, is what the what the city can uh, handle this is going to come in uh, potentially on the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina Juju uh, this is a much different track than Katrina actually it's a much worse track for New Orleans theoretically uh, so we're just going to see what happens I know they're they're rushing to
prepare for this as it quickly comes uh, to the coast. And that's ironic. Everybody has Katrina front of mind as this storm barrels down. But what has you most concerned as you eye this particular storm track? Well, you know, for one thing, you know, we've we've all rightfully been distracted with the other headlines in the news. So this hasn't been on the on the radar of the public really for as long as a lot of hurricanes are, and it's quickly moving to the coast, and it's going to rapidly intensify. It's one of these things that's been a cat three, cat four for days. So I'm not sure everybody is aware. I'm not sure everybody's ready to get out, and I hope that that they will be able to get out. Uh, if they're told to do that tomorrow. So that's that's concern number one. Concern number two is when you're talking about a Cat 4, I saw it in Lake Charles last year. Uh, some of these, some of the infrastructure and buildings in this part of Louisiana cannot withstand 140, 150 mile per hour winds. And it looks like that's where, what, what's gonna happen. So we're talking about widespread damage as if a large tornado uh, would be coming through. I wanna show you this one graphic, which gives you an idea of, of how goosed the water temperatures are. Two to three to four, degrees above average in this part of the Gulf of Mexico. And that is just fuel for, for, for the fire. Uh, obviously, climate change in this case is amplifying uh, this storm. And that's a, a bit of a frightening scenario for Southeast Louisiana, Juju. It's been 58 years since Martin Luther King led the historic March on Washington. And this weekend, thousands are expected to attend marches across the country, including in our nation's capital, to demand more action to expand voting rights. And for more on this, I'm joined by NAACP President Derek Johnson, whose organization you may know recently launched a national campaign to combat voter suppression. Thanks so much for joining us, Derek. Thank you. Uh, we know you wrote an op-ed in USA Today earlier this week emphasizing that voting rights should not be a partisan issue, and yet the reality is it very much is. The House recently passed the John Lewis Voting Rights Act this week along party lines, but it faces an uphill climb in the Senate. Are the, are the numbers just not there to get these bills to President Biden's desk? Well, we're going to need 50 members of the Senate to support protection of our voting rights. But we should not allow a procedural rule that was used by segregationists to impede our democracy. And that's what we're up against now. With NAACP, we're saying that there are 50 senators in the United States Senate to pass this legislation. It's not about partisanship. It is about our democracy. And yet, given that Democrats are struggling to find a path forward on enough votes in the Senate on legislation, what's the end goal for the protests this weekend? What's the message? Well, it is continue the heightened uh, urgency to make sure that this is a priority. If members of the Senate can come together and pass a three-plus trillion dollar package, surely they can pass legislation to protect the right to vote. This is not about one community. This is about our democracy. We're looking at the collapse of what took, that took place in Afghanistan. We send young people abroad to fight for this democracy. Surely we can pass legislation to protect it here on our home front. You're well aware, Derek, that uh, while President Biden has previously called the pair of voting rights bills in Congress a national imperative, he hasn't seemed to make it a big administration priority um, with issues like infrastructure, as you mentioned, and Afghanistan dominating the White House's time right now. Do you believe that the president has done enough on this issue, or is there a, a lack of political will or, or urgency from this administration? Well, for us, we're looking at this one uh, body at a time. The houses have done their job. Now it's for the Senate to do their job. And once the Senate do their job, we're looking for the president to sign this legislation. So we're really focused on the outcome, not the words, not the, 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 the statements of support, but an outcome to ensure all Americans can go to the polls, cast an effective ballot, and that we do away with political gerrymandering, which is so important to ensure that our voices can be heard across this country and have a true representative democracy. And so speaking of words, have you had any recent conversations with President Biden or, or his team on efforts on voting rights? And, and if so, what's the message? Well, yeah, my message has been consistent. We are in ongoing communication with both the leader of the Senate, uh, the administration, and our message is very clear. Pass this legislation. There are no other options. The sense of urgency needs to be there, and we're going to keep, keep pushing. We will have people on the ground and while they're on recess. We'll have people in D.C. when they come back in September because there is nothing more vital in this moment to, than ensuring that all Americans can exercise their right to vote. 
One of the um, details that stands out in your op-ed is the number of bills that have been introduced by state legislatures uh, making voting rights in this country more difficult. So far, you pointed to at least 17 Republican-led state legislatures passing voting restrictions in recent months. Given the pace at which Republicans are moving on these bills, are Democrats running out of time to address this before the 2022 midterms? Well, it's unfortunate that elected officials are trying to select their voters. In a democracy, voters select those who represent them, not the other way around. And we are pressing the sense of urgency of members of Congress to do their job. This is not a partisan issue. This is an issue to ensure that we have elections that are fair, that are transparent, that are inclusive, so all legitimate citizens can fully participate in the electoral process. And that's why we ask you for. This is not a Republican issue or Democratic issue. This is an issue about America. It's a moral obligation to protect our Constitution. And I want to get your reaction to another question brewing in the nation's capital today in the headlines. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling to suspend the CDC's nationwide eviction moratorium. Congressman Cory Bush, who led a protest that successfully led to the administration, taking action to extend that moratorium, said in a statement today that the black and brown communities, and especially black women, will bear the brunt of this decision. Your reaction? You know, Congresswoman Cory Bush is speaking from a personal experience. It is unfortunate in the midst of a current homelessness crisis that we are uh, witnessing in this country, something that's built, been building up for several years, is going to be compounded by individuals being evicted. We must have a permanent solution to, to the, the ability of individuals to be in housing. That's important. When you go to Los Angeles and you see the level of homelessness, you go to Seattle, Washington, or you name the metropolitan area, you see the cross-section of loss of opportunity, the lack of job opportunity, the, the need for mental health support, and young children who are living or in cars and in tents. It is a national disgrace. We must address the issue of homelessness. We must address the housing crisis as it has confronted this nation for, for several years now. Derek Johnson, president of the NAACP, thank you so much for your time. Thank welcome you for back. watching the news, and um, let's uh, have Claire welcome us back. Well, okay, let's welcome back to the Global Sunday, and um, thank you for all tuning in. Um, we've had an amazing discussion for the last couple of hours um, while we wait for our beautiful guest to arrive, and um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Swangile uh, Ngoma, who has been traveling for the last couple of hours and is finally able to but to be with us um why not wait for you you're extraordinary so welcome to the show and um i just sort of like to ask spongeli um how would you describe um like your life um uh, to anybody who doesn't know you like professionally and sort of privately, it must be quite an extraordinary life you have. Um, hi, and thank you for having me. I would describe my life as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting uh, because I, professionally, I'm a musician. I sing opera, oh. jazz, and mm -hmm. other stuff. Um, and then privately, I would say I'm a 50 year old with a five year old. So you can imagine that would be very interesting and um, quite challenging because <laughs> I thought I had, I was done with chasing after a toddler until I was blessed with a five year old. So yeah, it's an interesting life. And incredibly busy, obviously, because there's a lot of traveling that you've been doing. Yeah, I've had to travel a lot between Bloemfontein, where I live, and Joburg because of my activism. So it's quite busy and quite tiring. Um, but most of the time, it's just 
very, um, I guess, satisfying. It's satisfying to be doing what you believe is the right thing to do and sort of feeling like I'm fulfilling my purpose because I don't want to go through life just... Um, it, it, it is happening to me. I want to feel that I am on life. So with all the up and down and the, and the chasing this and the other one, it's satisfying. It's satisfying. And also, you know, you're making an impact on others' lives and, and making their lives richer as well. I would hope so. I would hope so. You know, you can't be making the that types of uh, sacrifices I make and not make an impact. I always say I I am purpose driven and I I want results. So everything I do, I want to see tangible results. And so yeah, I hope it is impactful somehow. Mm. Mm. That's People. beautiful. When I we have the pleasure that we get a. Um, a really deep in, intro, introduction. Pardon my my English. It's uh, just before midnight, so um, I'm I'm working on my uh, working uh, RAM. You say in the computer world, and a conversation before, and I just had some yogurt, so I'm going to be back now. So. We have uh, had a beautiful introduction. I read your biography and. I stumbled because I felt I want to meet the person, you know, words just say as much. And especially if there's a lot, then it, it becomes an imagination and very beautiful that you've taken the time now to join here. And I want to welcome you and I'm much looking forward to know more from you or about you. And I'm going to hand the torch on to the musician uh, uh, amongst us. I know, of course, the others also are musicians, but I consider myself not uh, just a musician with my body. So, David. <laughs> You're a jazz master, Fundi, though. <laughs> um, good, good evening. I guess it's uh, evening in South Africa, Simbole. Um, thank you for um, allowing us to uh, have a chat with you. Um, I'm in Australia with Claire. Uh, we're at two different ends of the country. I'm up in the, in the far north, but you've obviously been travelling and I, I haven't been to that area of South Australia with KwaZulu-Natal and I'm familiar with Durban and Peter Maritzburg and a little bit of jo Johannesburg. So you said, um, apart from your artistry and, and being um, the mother of a five-year-old, you said that uh, you, you, you're very busy with activism. So... Can you um, unpack that for us? Because I, I know at the time when I went to South Africa 20 years ago that there's, there was a lot going on and I'm sure there's still a lot going on. What, what sort of involvement do you have um, with, with causes in South Africa at the moment? Um, I'm the president of um, For the Arts, which I founded last year in January, as well as the new South African United cultural and creative industries federation. Um, so those two organizations basically advocate for the rights of artists. In South Africa, artists are still um, seen as unskilled labor, which is a problem because then you don't get the same recognition as other workers. You don't have the same rights. Uh, we, we don't get um, tax re that, and we are still taxed to income as freelancers. So artists are not prioritized at this stage. And what we are advocating for is that artists' lives matter. And the narrative that artists are dying as paupers, especially when they've had a global impact, is, is, is an insult to a, a very rich culture. So that is what 
I am fighting for to say South African artists are the ambassadors to the world. So why not recognize them as such as the South African public and the South African government? So it's time now that instead of just enjoying being on stage or doing our art, whichever way, shape, form they take, it's time then to say, what is the legacy we're leaving for our children? What are our generations going to experience as creatives in this country? Because uh, what I'm experiencing is that my predecessors, my predecessors did not leave the type of legacy for me that I feel safe and taken care of and protected by law. And so for me, it's important that there, there is legislation in place and policies that actually take care of the rights of artists and their uh, uh, intellectual property. So this is what we are fighting for. I mean, with the pandemic, you find that a lot of artists did not even get support. And that's where I started fighting a lot on the ground because there was something called the presidential employment stimulus package that was supposed to assist with resuscitating the industries who, you know, especially after about eight months of no work, no pay, and that was not dispersed properly. If anything, along the way, the money was lost. And I mean, they say lost, and I will use, you know, uh, inverted Real commas, time. because it's not, it wasn't lost. Somebody helped themselves to that money, and it didn't reach the intended uh, recipients. So in and I said, enough, it's enough now. We have kept quiet for this long. It hasn't benefited anyone. If anything, it's getting worse and it's becoming impossible to work. So that's the work I'm doing on the ground to say, okay, what are we doing for our generations? Uh, are the young people now also going to be at 50 fighting for their, for their rights and the rights of their children who want to be creatives in this country. So are you saying that the, um, for instance, the copyright law is not really respected in South Africa? And, are you, and also the other question was, do you orchestras and some people in the arts um, adhere to a union or a part of a union or there is no union for the... You see, this is just the thing. There is no copyright law because it hasn't been passed. And there are no unions because we are not recognized as workers. So how are you going to have workers unions when you are not recognized as a worker? Uh, literally classified as very... So how have unions? Yeah. That you know, in particularly in um, a pandemic, people, as we've heard, a lot of you know, they will they will go to Netflix or they will go to some sort of entertainment industry to take their minds away from you know what is encroaching on them, and it's the artists who are giving them some sort of solace, and yet. Um, you're not experiencing the same sort of respect. And th that is incredibly sad. And it, yeah, good on you for good on you for fighting. And it's a, obviously a big fight, but you know, fantastic. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like you say, it's ironic that the, our, our president and our minister for the Department of Arts and Culture, literally came out and said, create work and put it online, but you don't have the resources to do so. With a live performance, you know, there is that interaction with your audience. And yet online, you have to make it work, but you need the right equipment because it can come across very crass and very rough. 
So you have to find a way to make it elegant and sophisticated by using the right equipment. And right now, those resources are not readily available because somebody is helping themselves to the money that is supposed to make that process easier for us. Mm. In the, um, the Fontaine Young Educational Trust, we are starting a new um, worldwide accord of all fine artists. And I, um, I will, with your permission, con contact you after this broadcast and um, give you, uh, send you the accord. Um, the accord is aiming to do exactly what you are doing, but it's aiming to do it worldwide. Um, one of the, the, we all have talked about travel, all artists travel and travel and travel. And yet we don't have a classification, a visa classification that is acknowledged internationally. As you said, they are ambassadors for the entire world from South Africa, New Zealand, Latvia, Brazil, wherever you are from as an artist, you are the ambassador of your culture. And um, there are visa categories. We're trying to globally in terms of international um, departments of state to uh, you know create a niche for artists just for travel visas and as well as then right, we are a membership organization and and so we can support things like what you're doing in south africa so i i hope after um this this uh broadcast that you know with your permission that i will share that with you and we can even discuss it um i want to turn back time a little bit from what's happening now to your beginnings. Um, you have a very, very interesting um, start. Uh, you, you first studied law at university and then you moved across to the arts. Um, what was the moment that you realized that you had to move your career from a recognized worker status of high esteem in the law to something that is Nice. Not even you're a vagrant, you know. As all of us on the we we are not, and yet we are world leaders in our art forms. What what made you do that? What was that moment that you knew that was the right thing? I don't know if I ever got to a moment where I said, "Now I'm shifting over." It just happened to me. I became a professional musician by, by accident because I remember when I graduated my first degree, um, somebody said to me, just about two days before the graduation, there are auditions at the opera school and you should audition because you have the voice. And I was like, really? I don't think so. Anyway, so... I went and auditioned and they say, as they say, the rest is history, but I wasn't trying to change anything. It just happened to me. That is why now I'm deliberate about being active in deciding what is happening in my life because earlier on in life, it just, you know, things sort of just happened. You know, one minute you're graduating for something else and ready to pursue that. And the next thing you're being booked for gigs to sing, you know, stages you never thought you would because I grew up in a musical family and it was just a given that we, we sing, we play instruments, that's what we did and that's what we do. So it was never a thing for me that I would become a professional, it was just what we do at home and it was just standard. Uh, so I never, I don't believe that I ever reached a point where I said, okay, now I'm shifting to the arts. It, it was just the, that thing that just happened. And it was like one gig after the next. And I'm like, oh, it's two years later. I haven't pursued the other stuff. So <laughs> that's how I landed there. You know, you remind me of a little girl in Greece in the 1930s, I believe. Um, who wasn't allowed to go out and play until she washed the dishes for her very big Greek family. And so the, the, the sink had a window and all of her friends were out playing. And so she didn't want to be left out. So she sang while she washed the dishes. 
Her name is Maria Callas. And that's how oh. she stumbled into her career. So she could I'm be ter- with them too. And it ended up that people would gather every day after dinner when she was washing the dishes, they'd gather in the yard and they started paying tickets to, to listen to her sing while she washed the dishes. So, so you're the South African Maria Callas. <laughs> <It just happened. laughs> David, I, I, I jumped over you there. That's all right. I, um, I just thought of Ernest Hemingway's, he said, um, I'm a writer and therefore a disgrace. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, living, living disgracefully is, is wonderful. And, um, I, I, I just wonder like music can be within a country, the confines of a country, but very much broadcast and, and end up podcasts and YouTubed and televised across the world, um, simulate, simulcast. Um, and I'm wondering with the companies that, that make money out of South African artists that are not South African based, I'm talking about perhaps recording labels and things like that. Is there a way to um, get their support um, and, and talk to them about your plight or, or, or do you feel that those companies are sort of, well, um, thanks for your music and yeah, we'll go or something like that. Is there any sort of uh, dialogue happening with, with the international that, that are exploring using South African talent um, to, to help with these regulations? I think that part of the problem is that because we don't have agency, a lot of the intellectual property is leaving the country and the the creators of the content are not benefiting. So there's got to be a middle ground that we reach where um, companies are not just getting the content and taking it out of the country. There's a lot of books, for example, that have been written in the universities with the assistance of international lecturers that don't belong to the authors because there is no protection. And so there's got to be a way to have some type of dialogue where South Africa is not that poor often that is being assisted by the world and parents around the world. It's got to be on an equal footing where literally everybody says, we understand that these are not helpless people. These are people who actually contribute uh, in a meaningful way the same as everybody else. And if, if, if international record labels want to assist this process, then they have to start looking at South Africa from that angle, instead of um, working with South African artists as the poor cousin to the big names, as they call them, the big global names, because you find your, your, your big labels come in here and they give the smallest budget to South African artists. And all they are here for is to ensure that their artists from their countries actually get airplay and sell their product in the country. So their, their interest is not really to, 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 to uplift the South African artists. Their interest is to get into the South African market with their artists. So a different conversation needs to take place where literally we are now saying, how then do we get South African artists to the same level as every other artist ac- across the globe? I think I think you're on the right track, perhaps trying to get the, at least the first cornerstone legislation through that there is a copyright act so that um, if you write a song or, or produce a song or something that straight away with all, it, the way it works, and you're probably very aware in Australia, we're very lucky. If I, if I pen a tune this afternoon, it, um, it, it's mine for copyright for 70 years plus. Uh, so my lifetime, sorry, plus an extra 70 years um, to family or whoever I bequeath that to. So um, I think if you could get something legislated nationally, to protect you, then then all the um, the other issues might might be starting to be resolved. Where the record company coming in and saying, "Okay, well, we're going to have 
your opera singing um, and you say, well, you do, but there's a copyright act because of my performance as part of that, et cetera, the arrangement, et cetera, et cetera, and that's legislated and that's not negotiable. That's that's what it is if you want to do work in South Africa. So hopefully you'll be able to achieve that in the near future. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we, we have a little bit to our this that we still own our product, but uh, they they're trying to introduce other things that are making it more difficult to hold on to our product because you have to understand that when people are hungry they will sell their mothers. So how much more a song? Um, so if at least you could sell that song and make your money, at this stage, I'm not seeing people getting rich from making music. They are just getting by and surviving literally from day to day, not even month to month. It's now just a survival's game. And that's not, that's not right. And I always say, we've got to do the right thing. We have to see justice in all of this. Artists cannot just be those people that are not recognized as contributors because we are contributors. We contribute to the GDP. We contribute to the well-being of others. In fact, sometimes, so there's got to be a better way of doing what we are doing without being compromised in the process. So um, there was a study in Europe and also in Germany when the pandemic hit at the end of last year. And it showed that the arts and the so-called creative sector so we're also speaking about development of games, design, those departments contribute more to um, the, the, I'm gonna the general, move, sorry. that's fine, the general um, Sozial Produkt, I think you just mentioned uh, how that is called in, in English in the correct words, then for example, chemistry, or um, the business of traveling um, uh, or even I think communication. So what, what they made you understand that the creative sector and the arts, and that includes the performing arts and music are an essential part, not only for culture, but also financially. It's an, it's an important contribution. And I'm wondering from the conversation we had before that for an artist, it is always important to continue the arts regardless of the funds coming in. Otherwise it gets commercial um, arts. So also the fine arts, um, how we can get those things together, you know, to have people actually be aware that yes, um, you need to be able to pay for your rent and those things and the food and, and the, the everyday things. And at the same time, not put on the pressure of having to deliver all the time. So the question here is how to do that. I don't have an answer, but listening to you, I get aware of the analytical um part that you have and then you you're an artist as well so you're heads of the brain be creative having done it and then also being able to describe it to someone who what it means to and who doesn't know that creating um a work of music is not the same like creating a building although it involves many important aspects or it's not the same like 
um, creating a bank account or a functioning business for selling newspapers or a bar or um, all those things are legitimate and they, they are needed and entertainment is needed. So what, what I heard from you speaking about it is the ability of putting it down to facts and those facts they they're not negotiable so of course these facts exist here too but in the same time um, this year has been the first time in germany that instead of subvent giving subventions to electric cars or you know um, those things they actually decided that they're going to give funds to the arts um so that has been a new thing and there we ha we're having elections in september for a new chancellor and there is said he wants to put the arts on the civil rights uh the the all the the rights in general because even in germany they aren't part of how someone can help me out, how you call that, the Grundrechte, you know, is that the civil rights that the, you the, have? The human, right? human rights. Of the state, the arts aren't part of that. So, of course, what they always say is the arts aren't part of the necessity, you know, and they easily fall down on the back like what education does. Or um, in Germany, in, in the pandemic, the the single parents, they, they, they had a very difficult time um, because, you know, suddenly they were doing the education that because the children couldn't go to school and all the supports went to the industry because they had a stronger lobby. And I'm not coming up with a solution here, but that's what I was hearing from what you were saying. and. It was really helpful to hear you talk about it as a list of things, as facts, you know, and I'm just hoping that you're going to, with these drops, that this is going to create a hole in the stone. Again, my, my English, I'm not a native speaker, but uh, ein steter Tropfen hüllt den Stein means that the constant drop will create a, a hole in the stone, in the stone. Yeah. you know. So um, that's, it is part of, of the world and, and still, how can you explain if, if someone doesn't insist, like the industry, um, that it's, an, it's essential, however, to be able and not be called um, almost not illegal, but um, not having the status status of um, a, a, a worker, a legitimate worker. And I feel that speaking about it and creating a already here in this circle, it's a blessing you can hear from you directly on there to send this message out uh, and even send it to the universe so they can something can happen. Can I just um, jump in here? Um, obviously, you know, as we talked about before, you started in law and you went into opera and, and other forms of singing. And now you're doing a full circle in some ways, aren't you? Because, you know, all the skills that you acquired as a, a lawyer are now coming into play to fight for what is really important to you, which is your art form and the arts forms of your fellow artists. Um, so there's some sort of circle that's gone here that oh, you may you may have already you know been aware of this in your life that you've gone oh wow this is this has come full circle for me. Yeah, indeed, it's. Uh... It's very interesting because we were talking about exactly that uh, about two days ago and literally just, you know, you take stock and say, 
as much as I'm not a lawyer or practicing law, uh, advocating for rights and justice is literally coming full circle. And a lot of the, the skills and knowledge, I guess, from spending time with the law books comes in handy now when you insist on things and you say um, human rights, for example, they're basic human rights that we all have that are being violated on a daily basis when you refuse to give artists their, just their basic rights to shelter. Artists are losing their homes because they're not earning and there's no protection for them. And artists are losing their vehicles. Artists are Artists' children cannot go to school because they can't afford to pay the school fees. And that's a basic right to education. Now, these are not just uh, rights in the South African legal system or legislation. These are global rights, world human rights. Everybody has these rights. And somehow, when it comes to being an artist, they are not being recognized. In fact, they are being directly violated because somebody hasn't educated themselves enough to know that they are violating basic human rights. So it's important that we keep reminding them that if you don't know, don't let your ignorance make you break international laws because that will get you into more trouble what you may see as your right to loot the resources that have made have been made available to artists is actually you breaking international laws because you are now violating basic human rights that are recognized globally and the the the, the, crimin, the international criminal court can essentially come after you and this these are the things that sometimes i don't know if our politicians are taking time to educate themselves on because the violation of basic human rights national crime mm, absolutely and keep on hearing in my head t.s Eliot's hollow men and I think you know when when you lose your passion and your soul and have nobody to advocate for you and 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 fight for the, for the right to be um human that is you know full of vibrancy and and creativity and everything you you lose something and then the generations that go you know that that come from that will ne will never get that view that, that that richness of life i guess it's sort of like denying denying the future something and it's it's a basic right to be able to to offer what you are um what you are best at i guess you know what i find interesting is that we talk statistics the, 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 the rape statistics, murder statistics, teenage pregnancy. We are not looking at the causes for any of these. When art was respected uh, and given its place, children had something to look forward to. Now, they don't have anything keeping them busy. They sit on their phones, discover all kinds of crazy things that they can keep themselves busy with that are not necessarily building them or their character. Hence the need to revisit the role of the arts in society because the arts have kept us all sane over generations um, in Africa, for example, I know for a fact, well, particularly South Africans, we sing and dance, whether it's a funeral, whether it's a wedding, whether it's a birth, whether it's anything. Even when 
we protest, we sing and dance. That's just how we do. When we are doing sport, we sing and dance. That's just the South African way of doing life. So how are you going to deny a child the opportunity to, to gain that skill and hone it because you are not recognizing the importance of uh, formalizing that process. It's just the by the way, you know, like I was talking about how I, I fell into singing. It shouldn't be that. It should be encouraged in schools. It should be encouraged in the workplace. People should be told we need more musicians. We need more actors we need more this and that because the, it's an important service that keeps us all sane during the first lockdown i mean looking at the videos coming out of italy you know that music kept a whole nation sane the nation mm. sang together standing on their balconies so how is that not recognized as a necessity those are frontline workers we're not talking something that you, it's not just entertainment those are frontline workers keeping people sane and from killing themselves suicides come from a lack of outlet if people had an outlet they wouldn't be killing themselves you know one of the things that stated the development of the impact accord was um, in 1980, um, we had a president named Ronald Reagan, and he declared everything was a business. And he dissolved the line between commercial entertainment and fine art. Commercial entertainment is so entirely opposite fine art that if a, if a work of art is established and becomes popular, then it can become commercial entertainment. But if you create a work just to entertain people, then you are failing the job of the artist because the job of the artist is to use your art form, whatever it is, to guide society forward, to shine your light on the obstacle, to shine your light on the problem, to shine your light on the person that kept going in spite of it being a, a very uphill climb that gives the people in that kind of situation hope that if you apply yourself, you can keep going. It is fundamental without the fine arts, and that includes the indigenous arts, because the indigenous arts are simply day-to-day -day fine arts. They're not commercial entertainment business. And all of those fine arts are essential for civilization, society, and the human race's uh, survival. It's not simply um, the sanity, it is the sanity, absolutely. In World War II, if it hadn't been for Vera Lynn and Dame Margot Fontaine, a ballerina and a popular singer, the fact that Britain had lost 85% of its men in the Battle of the Somme in World War I that never recovered when they went into World War II, that nation would have fallen apart. It is, it is the fundamental lifeblood of human beings, what is what fine arts are. And that is, and, and in 19, just got eliminated completely. And then that caught on all over the world. Um, so it, it is this basic, it's not just a basic human right. It is that, but it is a human orientation to being alive. And the fact that humans must have community, you must have family, you must have a group of workers to farm the fields, you, you cannot be isolated. And it's that connection and that co communication with each other, how do we steer this ship forward? Um, and that is what why we initiated the Infact Accord. And, uh, to, and as you say, it violates international law to, to loot the funds that are meant to go to those artists that are guiding society forward. And it must be addressed that way. I, I, you are, you are our Joan of Arc, you know, with what you've done in Joburg. <laughs> and I don't mean you're just a really angry, crazy lady. I mean, <laughs> with an army behind her, I mean that you are giving the world an example to follow.
and it is it is it's such an honor to to speak to you today. Um, we came into this uh, interview with a script, and the script has been turned on its ear <laughs> by the by the reality of what this conversation is, and um, and so I have no idea what question is supposed to be asked um, at what okay. order. Now. Okay. Send it to David. David knows where we are in our script. Please help me out. Well, well, actually, it'd be nice to bring it back to the arts, to your art form, I think, because, yeah. you know, that is extraordinary. Well, I'll, I'll just preface that with a, with a comment. Um, in Australia, a bit unpalatable to a lot of people, and I can understand why, but I'm not Jewish and an outlaw activity um they, they changed their name to sex workers and as, as, um, i was just thinking whether when we call ourselves artists that's the only parallel i'm drawing by the way uh, when we call ourselves <laughs> artists perhaps we might should use the term and uh, change the terminology of, of our definition call ourselves arts workers put workers in the actual um in the in the, in the name of it it might have some sort of powerful benefit for people who are thinking in that terms. That's all, I'll leave, I'll leave it there. I don't know if that will ever take off. Um, but back to back to the music of you, and I, I watched some of your videos with great pleasure and, and, and admiration. Um, you, you're an opera singer of, of a high esteem, uh, world-class. You, you've, you've done the genres of classical right through to popular. You even do jazz. Um, and obviously you enjoy the variety of music. You've, you've mentioned that in, in the the life and culture of South Africa singing is, is, is everywhere, um, expressing yourself that way. Maybe it's a parallel within South America. People dance in the kitchen as well. Like they're doing dancing. But um, my question on, on your art form is, do you have um, a, a favourite genre or, or are you happy when you're doing jazz or, or, or another form that's not classical opera? Are you just enjoying that experience at that time? My favourite genre is music. Um... You know, somebody asked me um, how do, actually I was doing an interview yesterday and somebody asked me the difference between singing jazz and opera. And I was like, there's no difference. That's like, you take a piano, you play jazz on it, you play opera, you play gospel on it. It's still the piano. And so the voice for me is the same. It makes music. Uh, it doesn't make opera. It doesn't make jazz. As my dad says, you don't walk into a shop and ask for a first violin or a second violin or a third violin. You ask for a violin. So when I, I when people ask me this question, it's just, I do music. Uh, to me, it's it's about what what it does to my soul and how it makes me feel as my my professor used to say if you can't make yourself cry you cannot make anybody else cry so mm -hmm. if it makes me laugh if it makes me cry it doesn't matter what genre it is it's music it's it's more about the language of music than the genre of music for me. So I don't care what I'm singing as long as I'm singing or playing or listening. So for me, uh, I would say my favorite genre is music. Wow, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, not being a singer myself, which really troubles me because I actually think that I would have been a marvellous singer had I had a voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But um, my daughter sings incredibly well and it is so amazing to hear her and it's like I don't know where you got this from but I'm so pleased you do because it's just a joy to hear her. But um, I do, can you describe, and this is a sort of random thing but well you know go when you're singing opera obviously there's there's parts of your body really um woken up and, and used and i don't know I, i'm really i'm i'm a bit of a dodo here as far as you know the way people sing but does it change 
if you were doing something that was um, like jazz, is there certain parts of your body, like, you know, if, if I'm a dancer, I'm, uh, if I'm a, a, an actor, I need to use different parts of my headspace to get into a character. Is there something physical that happens with you when you're changing different styles of music? This is totally random, think, but, you know. No, it's not. It's not. Um, you know, when you encounter someone who can cross genres, it, 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 it's... It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proper conversation to have to understand where does it come from? How does it work? Uh, for me, it's the same discipline. It's the same discipline. The only difference, like you say, it's, it's tipping into the character. So I always say I'm telling a story. It doesn't matter mm. which genre I'm singing. So I still tap into the character. So yes, that's the thing that I would say is different is that uh, depending on which story I'm telling in which language, then I would have to go into that space. But mm. physically, it's the same discipline. Um, I'm as strict on myself with the jazz as I am, with the opera, with the pop, with the gospel. Uh, I can't sing less than. And if I hear something even compromised, I go back to it until it's uncompromised. So um, the same way I would train a student to say, go over that phrase over and over until it's smooth. I do that to myself. And I say, you can't just throw away notes. I, 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 I define it like, I describe it as you can't keep dropping notes along the way. When you take those notes, they all matter. They're all part of the language. They're all part of your vocabulary. So you use all of them with intelligence. So you keep them. You don't keep dropping notes as you go. So I would say it's the same discipline. That body is under strict regime of sing as if it's the last time you sing and you are never going to sing again. So yeah, no, there's no, there's no relaxing when you get here and being more strict when you get there. It's strict all the way through. And hopefully when it comes off well, then you can enjoy it more because I find I, I enjoy the music when I sound good. Then I don't feel like I'm working hard. I feel like I'm just having an, you know, I'm just having a good time, literally enjoying myself on stage while other people are looking at me. So I'm a bit of an exhibitionist in that way. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I've been trained in classical dance uh, starting at the age of 21. And um, then I also was trained then in contemporary techniques. And what you just mentioned reminds me of, of that path. Whenever it was, I was true to myself, I would experience the ballet class as fundamental as the improvisation even though that was completely different because in the ballet class there was a com of rules that would direct you know what to do and where and in the contemporary class that could happen as well depending on the teacher but it could also be in an, in an improvisation where it depended on the person's output and I could, I would be as strict to that, but the feeling um, would be different and it wouldn't be worse or better, or it would just be different, you know, essentially. And um, it's, it's been quite interesting to go through the different genres 
And whenever I would meet something new that I felt that was necessary to do to add to my library or to my, um, you, you would say you have a um, repertoire of expression, then I would acquire what I felt was necessary, which takes um, a lot of time. However, I would want to dive into it and, and, and go there. And I, I find it really refreshing to hear um, that from your side, because many times it's there's a division. And that's like mm. in mankind, many times there's a division of what you say isn't good enough, or it's not okay, or your language isn't appropriate, or I'm better. And there, there is a big division. And although we are all from the human race. So why would you go and say one thing is superior to the other when it isn't superior, but it's just different. So when I see a bird and the bird flying, the birds every time fly at their best. I can see them and I, I see them do it. And I see like, wow, that's incredible. They do their best to fly. But then you look at the tree and the tree is doing its best to stand there. And they're both legit, you know, it's not a bad tree because he's not flying good enough. And, and the other way around. And it becomes sad whenever there is separation happening. And it's a relief whenever that is dropped and we see that there are other kinds and not everybody's blessed to be able to go from genre to genre you know um you know we talk about horizontal jobs and vertical jobs nowadays more than ever that um, you have you're highly specialized um, and and that's important but also you need people who can connect the different pillars to each other and to go and do that has been very interesting for me too to go through the many different um, fields and keep on discovering and also i admire in focusing on one because it's enriching for me who's so elaborate my father my mother she's an architect and can you imagine the amount of details they're speaking about that when building a house, you know, every little screw, every little side panel, the colors of it, the dimensions of it, you know, it's, it's incredible, the amount of things. And then I come and I, I want to connect different parts, you know, different art forms. I want to connect film with music. And we spoke about it earlier today. I want to, and it turns out I have no clue of composition. And I might say things that he thinks like, hold on, it's going to take me eight months to compose that, <laughs> you know, and I just wasn't aware of it, but not because I'm ignorant. It's just, I didn't know. And it doesn't come from a bad intention. Then I go like, well, thank you very much, David. <laughs> I wasn't aware of the complexity of, of composing that and going through that and that you need to put a note on your on your door and say back in eight months <laughs> if you're taking on this one so you encourage people to look at something holistically um i've always felt it's important to take our audience serious even if they might not have the same education they might have not spent that much time like we've spent and we've said that before in, in 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 another show you know take the people serious we're speaking to and i've always felt that everybody can appreciate what we're doing regardless of their education when we're doing it also to the best of our ability rather than the best standards of what needs to be done. 
Um, I had a, a comment. Um, yeah. Just talking, you were talking about the, that, yeah, for you it's music, and I resonate with that a little bit. Um, the, the person who trained me in, on my instrument, my first instrument, trumpet, um, he was very uh, high-level, successful musician in, in Europe before he came to Australia and retired. And he he studied first at the conservatorium, I think was his home. And after doing six or seven years there, he went to Liège and did a, basically another um, conservatorium course there, at, to fit, like a finishing school for him. And then he, he had the classic um, classical training and background and the folk also from Russia and Bulgaria. And he went to America and... Um, Jazz was coming through in the era that he was coming through, and he he went to um, the school there, and he said, "So, so do you have schools of jazz here in the United States?" He said, "Yes," and they said, "This is our theory, and um, this is what you'll be learning if you enrol." And of course, <laughs> with the background that he's had, but perhaps you relate. Um, he said, "Well, all those scales already know them. All this, all those modes and, and things that you're you're introducing to your students, I know them." So. He didn't bother doing the course, and he, he, he played for Tony Bennett and a whole lot of people, um, and Maynard Ferguson was the first trumpeter in a big band. So um, I guess I guess your 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 understanding of music as as mine developed. I, I had an interest in jazz only as a youngster, and um, and now I write classical music for orchestra, and I have said occasionally the same thing. I said that it, so it, I do resonate very. The other comment I quickly want to make is that um, I can't think of his name, but he was doing a master. He's a trumpet player at a university, and he he, he came out with his trumpet, and the the, the band was behind him with a um, doing a riff or a harmony um, sequence, and he he came out with what we would call a clinker note, a really really strong bad note that was way off the um, harmony, and they they sort of stopped the session. And as a teaching point, he said, "Now I've just." Um, I played a note. How many of you people um, sat on the edge of your chair or we <laughs> felt something was not going there? And a few students said, "Yeah, that was that was really off or really so and so." But um, he said, "The point I want to make is, is the following: is that I'm communicating, as you were saying, I'm communicating with you, the audience. And if you're going to do um, this note, is not necessarily a wrong note. This note was in, I intended to play this note for the purpose of a teaching point, and and I played it with gusto. So." Um, the integrity of what you said. Um, each, 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 there are no notes to be dropped. That's that's what I was um, responding to. Hmm. Sure. You know what I found interesting that was said just now is the issue of we are all important. There are no superiors, no inferiors, and. This is where we keep missing each other. And with, with, with politicians, for particularly in public servants, is that um, if they understood that, I believe that the create, cultural and creative practitioners wouldn't struggle so much because then they would understand that we all have a role to play and it's not the same, it, it cannot be played the same way. Um, if you expect a fish to climb a tree, it will keep failing because it can't climb a tree, but you put it in the water, it will excel. Now, they, they see our gift as a tool to push their agendas. They don't see our gifts as the gift that keeps on giving. So, and that is what needs to change. It's a paradigm shift and it's a change of the narrative because that's where we need to be now. If anything, this pandemic has taught us is that we cannot go back to doing the same old same. We need to do however, is to think of new ways. This is our opportunity to rethink, reimagine, redirect, go back to the drawing board 
and recreate. We are called creatives for a reason, because we have the DNA to create, and we have the genius to come up with inventions. So it's time to be adventurous and do something new. And therefore, they need to engage us from that perspective to say, artists were always there to create new things and bring excitement. It's time. It's that time again to, to, to rediscover what it is that we were created for and not just entertainment now and again when people are bored, but to, to reimagine the spaces. How do we make the hybrid work ethic now uh, viable? It's up to us, the creatives, that. Because how do you work in the physical space? And the space that we're working here on you have to find that hybrid way of working and the smooth transition, which is what makes it interesting when you find a crossover artist, is that the knowledge of how to move from one genre to the other without blinking an eye. And that is what our politicians should be asking us. Artists, how do we transition? And how do we move from space to space with smoothly without any hiccups or anything and and all they can think of is the final product of the previous generation they must look at the final product uh, the the creative process of this generation maybe politicians should take some drama classes and some singing classes and just <laughs> take time out and you know lose themselves in in the beauty of what we do because you know it you cut off that part of your your soul if if you're constantly in um political speak and everything and you know i don't i don't think it'd be a bad idea if if um parliament you know stopped for 15 minutes did a song and then went back to it 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 would change the vibrant the energy that that's just my take on things. Yeah. I think you did right would, about, sorry. No, it would help them to stop being so anal retentive. Yes. I think um, you're totally correct the way you expressed that, Simboli, about um, the the politicians are very interested in using art as a tool for their, for their agendas. And that was a point of, our discussion even before you came on this morning that there are there are there's funding in Australia. I can only speak mainly from this reference, but a lot of the funding that, that dribbles down to the local for artists, um, there's an agenda of things that the the politicians have, have um, embedded into the into the grant application um, in order to um, uh, promote something that or, or or somehow there's a there's a there's a contrivance about it and. Um, the politicians are not doing what you just said, looking around and seeing that the artists are, are being magnificent and creating for their, their time. Um, so art that's now being created tomorrow or this afternoon in South Africa or wherever could be could be a monumental um, sculpture or something that, that, that tourists are drawn to in the next 20, 30, 100 years with, with thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars in ticket sales, if you want to talk, talk about the money from it, but um, the the politicians are, are retrospective. They they're worried about success or failure, um, about being blamed, etc. So yeah, they're looking at older generation um, things that are being successful. I, I I know exactly what you're talking about. I went to a minister of tourism. I had a, a large piece of work that's based on a symphony based on a, on a natural thing we have here and. Um, I said to the minister, I'd be very interested if I could, you know, get some funding support. And she said to me, um, at the moment we have the Nicole Kidman and they're doing the Australia movie in, in the town of Bowen and, and, and it's international and, and that's our focus at the moment. And that movie was done, uh, government subsidised a lot of it. There was millions of dollars at play and me, I don't know, but most people regard that movie as a bit of a flop artistically. 
um, because, and that's exactly the politician that I was speaking to about something that was um, another possibility, not, not millions of dollars, we're talking thousands of dollars, a few thousands of dollars, wasn't prepared to even um, investigate further because they, they were in the thinking, well, Nicole Kidman has been an icon for Australia and this, this is going to be a success because she's in it and because it's based, et cetera, et cetera. So exactly what you've been explaining, um, I've, I've been part of firsthand. So, yeah, well, well, well expressed. So um, I again, I'm I'm a, I was a classical singer and um, had a surgery that made me have to sing non-classical music. I I did a lot of work in in church. Of course, I sang in church professionally most of my adult life. Um, but I'm I'm a classical trained singer and dancer, and um, I don't improvise well, and so I am still a bit lost in what our script is. Um, and so I think that what might be good is so uh, to, to take a break and um, uh, we'll go to the second news segment that's about the progress of the COVID um, crisis. It's not just a pandemic, um, but also I believe that some of our panelists um, are going to have to leave the panel. So let's take a break and go to the news now and then we will... Uh, you know, circle our wagons. Oh, that's an American thing. Uh, that just means we'll get ourselves together and then we'll come back after after the news and um, hopefully a video break as well. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. After increasing for nearly two months, the global number of COVID-19 cases and deaths was stable last week. But it's stable at a very high level, more than 4.5 million cases and 68,000 deaths. However, the situation is very different from region to region country to country, province to province, and town to town. Some regions and countries continue to see steep increases in cases and deaths, while others are declining. As long as this virus is circulating anywhere, it's a threat everywhere. There are no shortcuts. WHO continues to recommend a comprehensive risk-based approach of proven public health and social measures in combination with equitable vaccination. Israel's nationwide vaccination campaign was hailed as a success story that helped to drastically reduce infections in the country. But the latest Delta variant outbreak has led to an increase in cases and many experts believe that the crisis is far from over. Israel was one of the first countries to vaccinate a majority of its population in a very small amount of time. By June, the mandatory mask requirement was completely dropped and the only COVID curbs that remained were regarding international travel. Now, the rate of infection has again risen to 5.4% and the Bennett government has said that it will take necessary measures to avoid further lockdowns. As Israel's COVID wave continues to worsen, the country's top COVID official admits that authorities mishandled the crisis with regard to inoculating the unvaccinated. During an interview, Israel's coronavirus czar, Professor Salman Zarka, said that COVID-19 is here and it will stay and we may have to wear a mask for many months. While acknowledging the government's mistake, Zarka said that officials were pressurized to formulate policies without sufficient data. Israel has one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, with 78% of the adult population fully vaccinated. Despite this, the country is currently witnessing a significant spike in cases. Our correspondent Jody Cohen has sent us more details in this next report from Jerusalem. Listen in. 
Israel was an early success story in the COVID pandemic, effectively becoming the testing laboratory for Pfizer's vaccine and sharing its medical data with the world. However, coronavirus SAR Professor Salman Zarka now says Israel dropped the ball and should have done more to encourage further vaccination while COVID cases were low. Suggesting Israel won the battle but the war is still here, he said preparations are needed for a possible fifth wave. With kids going back to school next week and the Jewish New Year festivities approaching, the government is busy looking at what more it can do to limit the spread of the Delta variant. This is Jody Cohen from Renana Israel for Weon World is One. Weon World is One is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news updates on the move. Good evening. The reality of our battle with COVID hit home today as the state recorded the worst case numbers of the pandemic so far, 1,035 new infections. It's placing immense pressure on our ambulance system and pushing our paramedics to their limits. Ali Naiman. 70 years old, died from COVID at 4.30 this morning, left behind 14 children and 53 grandchildren. Ali from Yaguna didn't know how he got the virus and he had had one shot of a vaccine. His devastated daughter Amy now has a message. Take COVID seriously, stay home and get vaccinated. In Milson's Point this morning, tributes for Jimmy. Jim Saad was a fixture of the train station, working as a cobbler and key cutter for nearly 60 years. Another casualty of the state's COVID crisis. To have any loved one pass away at any time is obviously challenging, but in this COVID situation, I think many of us are feeling it uh, even more. 1,035 new COVID cases in the past 24 hours, another all-time high. And to 8pm, two more people who've lost their lives. A woman in her 70s died at Nepean Hospital where she caught the virus. A woman in her 80s from Western Sydney has also died. In a war with a virus, our paramedics are the firing line. Our workforce is going from job to job to job without a break. They are virtually wrapped in plastic. They are doing their job without expecting anything in return. Just yesterday, called to help 450 patients with COVID or suspected COVID. Over the last three days, New South Wales Ambulance has experienced call demand to triple zero, equivalent of our busiest New Year's Eve. But Officials you. found low confidence it was an animal infection that started COVID and a moderate confidence that it was a lab incident. I assume you've read this report. If, if that's the case, should China be held more responsible for this? And, and how do we move forward? Well, let me, let me tell you what I think and then I'll tell you what I know. What I think um, is that uh, the report was pretty unsatisfying because the intelligence community, even though the president asked them to, was really not able to come up with a definitive answer uh, as to whether or not this was natural transmission from animal to human or whether there was a lab leak. Now, this is something that I've been reading about for a very long time in classified environments. And, you know, the intelligence community is a little bit at odds with itself on that. Now, why is that? And here's where you absolutely do hold the Chinese accountable. The reason for that is that the Chinese from moment one, 18 months ago, have not been open and honest uh, with the world or with the United States with the data and the information that we would need to form uh, some kind of a judgment. Well, I appreciate all of your insights. Connecticut Democratic Congressman Jim Hines, thanks for your time tonight. Thank, thank you. Tonight, with an expected major hurricane taking aim, Louisiana hospitals already dealing with a surge of COVID-19 patients are now preparing to shelter in place. Dr. Jeffrey Elder telling me this is a worst case scenario. This is a large hurricane. We have to be ready for that. We know we're going to have higher census because of the COVID patients in the hospital. And so we're preparing for both simultaneously. Louisiana has one of the highest COVID-19 case rates per capita in the country. The storm already forcing some testing and vaccine sites to shut down early. As residents race to prepare and evacuations begin, Ida is forecast to make landfall 16 years to the day since Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Okay, we met Dr. Tanner Libsack, still in his scrubs from treating COVID patients, now preparing to board up his home. And 
And Victor Akenda joins us now. Victor, Hurricane Katrina devastated the city, as we all know, 16 years ago. And hospitals in, had a lot of major difficulties at the time. How are they preparing now differently, perhaps? Juju, one of the doctors that we spoke with explained how hospitals here have been hardened since Hurricane Katrina to bear the brunt of a storm. They fixed issues like water, sewage, electricity, and he explained how in the event where they have to be cut off from the rest of the world for some time, they're ready. Juju. Tonight, the toll of the pandemic growing by the day. More than 1,200 deaths reported in just 24 hours, the highest single day total since early March. It's tough for the ones who have been through it already to see to see these people struggle and die. In just the last month, the virus spreading like wildfire. All 50 states now reporting high community transmission. In Oregon, hospitalizations up nearly tenfold in the last six weeks. But with fewer staff and fewer beds, we're struggling to meet patients' needs. Hospitalizations in Kentucky breaking records. The governor frustrated. I'm going to admit up front today, um, a little emotional and a little raw. But in Florida tonight, a major legal victory for 10 school districts to find Governor Ron DeSantis' ban on mask mandates. A judge ruling the governor overstepped his authority, DeSantis vowing to appeal. This as the country reaches a new milestone. 50% of kids 12 to 17 years old have now had their first vaccine dose. And overall, more than a million doses administered in the last day, the most in eight weeks. In central Florida, Lisa Stedman now wants the shot. She and her husband were holding off when they both got COVID. Lisa coming home from the hospital this week, only to find her husband had passed away from COVID-related complications. And remember, you are not promised tomorrow, so you better make sure you tell your loved ones you love them. And Witt joins us now with the Director of National Intelligence today releasing that unclassified assessment on the origins of COVID-19. Tell us about it. Juju, this report indicates that the intelligence community is divided over the findings Four agencies assessing with low confidence that the COVID-19 virus spread to humans naturally from an infected animal. Another agency assessing with moderate confidence that it came from a lab leak or lab incident of some kind. However, there is more agreement that the virus was not created as a biological weapon. Still, more information is needed from China. And tonight, President Biden is promising that efforts to understand and the origins of this pandemic will not rest. Okay, welcome back to the Global Sunday and what a discussion we are having today with Bongile Ngoma. It is one of those discussions that you you don't often have and I'm I'm thrilled to have been part of it so far. So um, I'm going to pass it on because we're going to do a little bit roundup of people right now. So David, do you want to add your two bobs worth? Simbongalai, thank you so much for um, being on the panel. Thank you, Langani and the team. Um, we we realise this is so much more to be to be um, work through here. So we're, we're going to invite you, if it's okay with you, for part two. Um, there's a lot of questions we didn't even get to, and um, I'm going to say this and take it in a nice way. I'm going to call you the iceberg only from the point of view, not that you're a cold person to uh, address, but because the 10 percent is all we saw. There's a, there's a 90 percent lurking under the water, and we we have to go there if if you allow us. So thank you so much. Um, I look very much forward and hope I'm around for part two and find out more. Thank you so much for um, being with us today. Thank you. Well, I'll go next. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, our uh, viewers out there all around the world. Um, just like the panelists from all around the world, you are everywhere and you are everything. And um, I am so delighted that we could have this beginning of a conversation. Um, Spongile, I'm, I'm delighted. You and I had talked earlier when you were during your activism and I cannot wait for part two. And thank you so much for all of the richness you've given today. Thanks for watching.
This is the Global Sunday Show. See you next week. Stay tuned and stay safe. Take care. Absolutely. Um, also, I would like to say thank you, uh, Mam Goma, uh, for sacrificing your time. I know it's very late there in South Africa. You've been traveling. You must be exhausted. Um, you are very strong. That proves that you are very strong. Um, and thank you so much for sharing all the information that you shared with the people who are watching at home. Um, I mean, there's like very rich information that you guys shared here. And, um, you know, I know you guys went out of script and I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? Because this is like very, very important information that you were sharing. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you so much, people. Thank you so much, Mr. Pike. Thank you, Mr. Laden. And of course, our special guest, thank you so much, um, Mam Goma. Um, I'll let you say your last words and then um, I'll say hello to people who are watching at home. Thank you so much, Global Sunday, for having me. What a Claire, Mr. Laden, people, uh, David, and Longani, thank you for keeping in touch and making sure that I meet these incredible people, incredible artists. I'm privileged, I'm honored, and I'm looking forward to part. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, that was uh, that was the Global Sunday. That was the Global Sunday show. Um, um, remember, there is Upatu Ozofika with Umamum Goma all the way from South Africa. Quickly, I want to say hello and shout out to Umlu Velase. Uh, he's been with us and watching the show. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Shabalala Wawichunya Mambazo and shout out to uh, Black Mambazo all the way from Eklamonti. Zulu Pavarotti, shout out to you. FC Nyandeni, shout out to you. Please do follow us uh, on social media, The Global Sunday, all our social media, and do also follow Diverse TV. You can find them on YouTube, Diverse Global Studios. For me, Ulungani Guala, Ngiti, bye, bye, bye. But you can't wait to see you next Ulungani Guala, a.k.a. Mfanaga Chocolate Kid Leo. I'm just going to play... A uh, live performance from uh, our special guest, Yanam Sanjay. Bye! Huh? <laughs>